Okay, you guys ready to go? Let's get started. So uh, with any luck, we'll get out of here a little early tonight as you know, the workload lightens up, other than, of course, your four-page paper that you should be working on incrementally, but considering you've had essentially a month to do it, it shouldn't be a big burden, but uh, lectures are uh, going to be relatively less demanding. Actually, I, I, put, I did put up three articles for this week rather than the two I initially had. I found a recent bit of actual objective research that had been done on the open office concept in Australia, so I added that, but if you guys didn't, didn't read that in time, that's okay. It was just a brief little article, and we'll talk about what it said. So coming up, quarter 12, final decisions. So I guess next week there's some sort of national holiday involving typically Turkey, so we're not going to have anything due. So uh, our decision round will be also be pushed a week. And uh, 11.29. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, that's 11.29. <laughs> no, we're going we're gonna to make you guys so stay time. after the end of the term. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got a lot of time. Yeah. Um, final paper due 12, 14. Uh, and the, the bonus points reminder again on that. Oh, uh, I'll say that... Um, I, uh, I I have set aside tomorrow. I was supposed to do it Monday, Tuesday, and fortunately a, a project uh, got in the way of getting all caught up on grading everything. I have done my first review of all of the pitches, elevator speeches, and um, looking pretty good. But uh, I have to get all those grades in, so uh, that that is scheduled for tomorrow. So. Anyway, try to get all those updated before you guys head into Thanksgiving weekend so you can see all your scores on that. And the in-class participation, which has generally been excellent, and almost all of you have been nailing 100%. You show up, whether virtually or physically, and uh, most of the time you guys are getting 100% on it. So, uh, Marketplace Live, the final grading, and um, actually I'll talk about the, uh, the glitch in a bit. Let's go over this first. So after quarter 12 processes, it's the cumulative balance scorecard again that determines the final grades. It operates more like a log scale rather than linear, so relatively large value differences aren't, aren't uh, necessarily accurate. That's exaggerated. I've prepared where it stands of as of right now um, on a log scale, so you guys see what that looks like. Um, so this is to reflect the relative importance of each team above or below another. Set the average for the performance of the class anywhere between 87 and 93, depending on how heated has the competition been, how much time have you folks been spending out there. And I, I can't literally tell how much time you guys spent on there because it's obviously possible to open a browser and log in and walk away and do absolutely nothing. Um, but it does give me sort of a hint relative to prior classes as to who and how much time is being spent on there. And overall, the class has been, been very solid and good, so the average will be uh, towards the higher end of that range. And uh, so uh, this is the most challenging version of a simulation, don't know. So uh, most of the classes that employ the simulation are for undergrads, and they use a much shortened and simplified version uh, maybe a half or even fewer number of decision metrics, so there's not so much interaction going on, so it doesn't take so long to get up to speed and sort of figure out what the uh, consequences are in certain decision areas and other performance areas. So uh, bear that in mind, so you guys have generally done pretty darn well. Don't take bankruptcies personally. Um, yes, it mimics real life. When you think about this, if this were really a startup environment and we were going through the first few years of the computer industry, there are a lot of computer brands that aren't around anymore, right? Um, they, they had high flying lives early on and then boom, typically it was spectacular burst at how they, how they went up and we had some of that in our, in our simulation course here, so that worked well. Yeah, so there was the, the big glitch, and so Sean caught it. Microtech was hit with um, a bunch of excess ill will. It was calculated wrong. I, I, it's very odd that it hadn't shown up in prior iterations, prior processing this. I think that's an expression of the fact that most, again, the vast majority of classes don't use this version of it. They use an easier one. 
for some reason. They're always upgrading and modifying code on this thing, and somewhere in there, someone screwed up in one of the upgrades, and, and it created this. So anyway, um, Microtech was kind of uh, uh, slammed down by that, and so adjusted, it didn't have huge impacts for most of you. It, did, it had some impact for RJN, but uh, they're, still, they're still doing well, it's okay. Um, and again, like some of these things are, are sort of exaggerated, the relative performance. Um, market share is, is a more meaningful metric. Um, yeah, yeah, super tech struggling a wee bit. Yeah, um, in a tackle. <laughs> um, well, and actually, you will be happy to know, Pamela, that our prizes are for our last session. And indeed, that is one of them. So I think you're oh, basically right. a shoe and you're Syed, man. You, you got one nailed, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then I prepared the uh, balance scorecard on a log scale for you guys. Uh, so this is the way the simulation really looks at how to score your relative performance. <coughs> and so, for example, it's still pretty much nip and tuck between Microtech and RJN. Um, even though, objectively, the numbers might, might look far apart, uh, the way the simulation processes it, um, that's still up in the air, actually, who, who the winner is. Lots of strategery in the last round, right? So, oh, and so uh, any questions on last round, Jeff? I just want to say I like this view a lot better than the one that you guys. <laughs> it does. It does. It, I'm not sure it's helping Super Tech, but it does help most of the companies feel better about their performance level. Absolutely. We should yeah. make everybody feel better. <laughs> that's right. Right. So that's uh, and that we're talking about the human economy. So that's part of the human economy, right? It's about how you make your peers feel about themselves. That's a piece of it. Say it. Just a general question about the simulation. Do you know anyone that might have actually? You know, know, use this simulation and done well in a business or in a new venture kind of thing? Tried to replicate the simulation in the real world and launch yeah. a business based on it? Yeah. I mean, just, or, I mean, just kind of followed the steps that we followed, like, in the, in the simulation and actually did well in business? Um, not in a literal sense, no. Okay. But for sure, this, uh, this is used in some MBA programs. Okay. For, and, and this is a great way in a relatively short period of time to teach a lot about operational strategy. Um, it's, you know, as far as, you know, you think about conventional business school and you've got marketing, you've got finance, and you have accounting, and you have operations management, you have all these very delineated, siloed expertise to some degree. There's not a lot of integration about how does this stuff interact with each other. That's what MPL is fantastic at. So when you get out there you, and you're in a situation, you're in a startup company, and let's say you actually are selling some sort of hardware-based product, and uh, you don't, you're, you're very early on, and you know, high-level analysis isn't necessarily applicable yet because your sales is so small, but you intuitively understand what the impacts are to um, spreading your manufacturing over a multi-week period and then having gaps um, and what and intuitively what that tends to do to your inventory balance and how that might impact you if perchance you should actually get a little spike in demand for your product and how that might anger customers and so that's something you know you'd walk away from MPL with that like a conventional MBA program might not deliver to you uh, like our simulation and the quarters like and everything that we did wrong, I think um, I think I understand. I mean, I'm just wondering if I could apply the learning that I have, you know, all the things that we didn't do correctly in, in the real life, you know, in a startup. And it's something, yeah, but it, you know, it has to be taken with a grain of salt. And, and obviously it's based on, you know, historical practices. And, and one huge difference is that the dynamics are fundamentally different in software world versus hardware world. And, um, yeah, so uh, a lot of the things, at least you know, relative weightings and importance of, uh, importance of various factors and their interactivity are different in a software context. And of course, the predominant uh, nature of startups these days is software. So that's, that's one big difference that would tend to get impede your ability to apply it in real life. Yeah. Other thoughts? Emily. Uh, I'm looking forward to 
gives us all these nice, tidy numbers that we look at. I'm like, does this really happen in the real world? No, no, not at all. No, yeah. So that makes things a little harder. Right. Yeah, no, the quality of information generally is really, really terrible until you're a very established and mature company, typically. That's one of the huge differences. And it's um, my other class I'm teaching right now is um, engineering economics. It's microeconomics, so it's about individual project uh, decision making quantitatively, analytically. And I have to bite my tongue the whole way through this class because it's all wildly unrealistic. Because they're doing all these super fine things like, oh, and they're projecting whether the rate of inflation is going to be two and a half or three and a half percent, and how that's going to affect whether or not you green light this certain, like, let's say, manufacturing equipment replacement program. And it's so ridiculous because the quality of information is never there. Never. There's too much volatility in all the markets, in currency exchanges. You cannot approach strategy that way in the real world. And, it, and this textbook and, and all of them in this area deliver this very false sense that you can control things precisely and you can't. It's not what the real world is like. And, and I, I, try, I try not to rip on, on the textbook too much, but I do have to tell my students repeatedly that like, bear in mind that you will not typically have this quality of information, that the company you work for will not have super precise projections of where inflation is gonna be in five years. It's like the best, you know, economists, the Nobel Prize winning economists can barely tell you where it might be in six months. So that's kind of the reality we're dealing with. Is, is that an um, undergrad level class? It is. What? Okay. It's an undergrad class, yeah. So, why are we going to talk about hiring, human resource practices, and culture today? It is often the area where companies can develop a sustainable competitive advantage. It's another MBA catchphrase right there. Something that makes, makes your company tend to whoop the competition on an ongoing basis. Most of the companies we've talked about, if they have a sustainable competitive advantage, it is typically not in their technology. It is in all these other soft areas. Uh, Google is a fantastic example. We'll talk about them today. Changes very quickly. So it's an important thing for managers to revisit on a regular basis. Huge differences across various companies. Widespread ignorance of there's actually starting to be more academic research. Like I mentioned, we've got this little uh, article out of Australia talking to the open office space plan. And some aspects are really inexpensively implemented, easy to do, low hanging fruit, and yet a lot of companies still fail to do it. So there's a lot of opportunity here if the management of the firm has the right attitude, approach, risk tolerance, et cetera. And <laughs> yes, and I, I love, you guys have mentioned office space, and I love it too. Plastic. I didn't used to have said, I, I don't care if they lay me off either, because I told, I told Bill that if they move my desk one more time, then, then, I'm, then I'm quitting. I'm going to quit. And, and I told Dom too, because they've moved my desk four times already this year and I used to be over <laughs> by the window and I could see the squirrels and they were married, but then they quit. Hi, Milton. I, I, I said, Mil, we're gonna need to go ahead and move you downstairs into storage B. No, we, I, I was told uh, I could not. new people coming it, in and no. <laughs> all the space we can get. But there's no space. So if you could just go ahead and pack up your stuff and move it down there, but no, that would be terrific. I, I, I was told okay. I could stay. It, <laughs> I believe you have my stapler. Please. <laughs> Milton? Yes. What's happening? I wanted to say, hey, Milton, you know what would be great? Good Lord. <laughs> down here. It would be really great if you could just sort of Take care of the cockroach problem we've been having in here. No, that's really not my job, and I, I haven't received my so this is for now. Why don't you go ahead and get yourself a flashlight and a can of pesticide? And excuse me, excuse me. That's really good. That's the last straw. Yeah. <laughs> And that, that really was the last straw, if you guys know the movie. He burns the place to the ground. Yeah. 
<laughs> yes, that's, that, that was the homage. Initech, that's the name of the company, yep. So, related to office space, the, uh, the larger article, City Dump Their Desks. Um, and the first asynchronous participant we have is Michael. Um, I kind of tend to have a little bit of an old-fashioned opinion on this week's topic. Um, I personally like having personalized space that's mine, um, especially something that's a little bit more um, private or secluded just because I get very distracted very easy. Um, so to have a cubicle that's closed in or an office I can close the door um, works much better for me than an open office environment. Um, but I do also see the advantage of having um, encouraging employees to be a little more mobile. Um, the company I work for is uh, still very old fashioned. Um, one of our employees here used to go offsite every afternoon to get a little bit of work done and um, to a local coffee shop and he was told basically he just stopped doing that. It was frowned upon because people didn't think he was getting his work done. Um, where, so I see if somebody needs to go somewhere to get stuff done, you allow them to do it, but I still like having my own personal space to, I guess, come home to my every day at work. All right, so Michael prefers the private space to get rid of those distractions, likes to have a home at work. Coworker is told to stay in the office rather than work at the coffee shop because he's, quote, not getting the work done. Um, so uh, what do you think about that uh, comment about not getting work done, Jack? I used to work in an office that was kind of an open floor plan, and it's great if you need to get information from other people, but it's terrible if you need to concentrate and do anything, because there's constantly people walking by and saying hi or asking you questions, and uh, you know, eventually I had to, uh, we had this one kind of serious situation where our server got struck by lightning, and uh, like <laughs> rather than having people come up and asking me about all these different questions that they had, um, we like, okay, here's a list, write down your question, and he'll get to it when he gets to it. Right, tape it on the back of your chair so that before they tap your shoulder to ask right. you, they, they... Ash, Ashwin, did you ever hand it? Yeah, it's like, uh, depends on like the company you're working for, mostly software companies these days allow for work from home or like work from any place that you want. If it's different on team mate, your work is dependent on team that Office makes sense. Yeah. So the first article that you shared, they talk about how uh, earlier people used to invest in in a person, like everything used to be get uh, done with their hands. Now, now these days people invest in brains. Mm -hmm. This is what uh, Ashwin said. As far as people are getting their work done, wherever it is, they should have the liberty. That way they feel more involved and more comfortable and stay for a longer time. Uh, Emily, I think you had your hand up too. Um, so, I've worked remotely a lot, a lot, um, and I love it. But when I am in the office, one of the challenges is that I have to work from home. The idea of people not having their own space, I think would drive me nuts, because like, if you want to go talk to someone, you want to go talk to someone, you don't want to hunt them down. Like, that would be the first thing. Sorry, Tim. <laughs> um, I think a lot of companies that say, like, if you're not in the office, then people don't think you're getting the work done, probably don't have good metrics on whether the work is getting done or not. Yeah, so this, is, this is kind of like, uh, this is a quote um, pr from sort of you know, 20, 30 years ago, where if you're not in the office, you must not be getting work done, right? Yeah, yeah. and I mean, maybe uh, there are certainly some places where that's true. I mean, you know, we manufacture on site and can't do that from home, but right. a lot of the other stuff, um, you really just need to be in front of a computer and available for conversations. Yeah. The judging performance by a butt in a seat is really uh, backwards. Pamela, you had your hand up? Yeah, so in, I think a lot of, I, unfortunately, I think a lot of companies try to do a one size fits all kind of model. And too often we have employees that are introverts and others that are extroverts, depends on your product or service. You know, there's a lot of variables and to just kind of do a one size fits all usually for 50% works, for the other half of the population, it totally Yeah, does. excellent point. So it's not a push I I Oh, our line. Patrick. Oh, <clears throat> thanks. Um, yeah, so that uh, that quote really rubs me the wrong way because I've, I've always hated getting told that uh, you're not getting work done from home. 
we had a policy at work a few months ago, they were trying to get more overtime in and they said, well, if you're doing overtime, we'd prefer you to be here because you won't be getting the same work done at home. And, um, but I think that that what I really hate about that is that it's kind of taking away autonomy from your job. And I know that that was mentioned a, a couple of times in the articles tonight is that, you know, to, to be told how you have to do your job is very demoralizing. Yeah, and we'll, we, we have a, uh, a clip from a TED talk today on that, on that very topic for sure. Who else, I think, go Kushbu. So uh, one of the problems I had with open workspace in my uh, previous company was that people were really nosy so they would, just, they would just come and see what you're doing on your street. Talk about that. They, would, they would see what, who are you messaging, and they would just be genuinely nosy. So I, I don't like open workspace because of that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Alan. Well, my experience with that phrase of not getting work done when you're on your home office, um, it's that depends a lot of the, of the person uh, because uh, I've, I've seen, for example, a uh, sales engineer that are, they are very focused and they they work a lot. They you, you don't need to be uh, just telling them pre and prepare and prepare uh, prepare visits, uh, make quotations, etc. But there are others that they don't do nothing if they're if they stay in homes and during six months or a year they don't deliver nothing. So right. that a lot of that depends on the person, and unfortunately, I can. I, I think that the problem is in the human resources area. They, right. they don't know how to filter per people. Right. Oh, and, and Nestor, I, I can't see the uh, remote students on the monitor. If I could, that would be fantastic. Tim, you had your hand up? Uh, um, yeah, I really think autonomy is, is just a huge part of that. Uh, it seems like the, the more highly specialized the job sometimes, or the more creativity, or the higher level it is, I mean, the more autonomy it requires, and that seems to be a huge thing as far as empowering employees, um, requiring them, saying, here's exactly what you have to do, uh, just takes a lot of the motivation away. Yeah. Yosh. Um, I think that autonomy is a critical part of motivation, but I don't think that it's the whole thing. Some of the other uh, stuff that I've read about and heard uh, convinced me was there was autonomy, there was mastery, being an expert in whatever that field is, and then also purpose. Do you actually care about what what that work is going to accomplish? Yeah. Uh, Sean, yeah. So the example of a city getting rid of the desk completely, that you know you show up to work and you go grab a random one. I think there's two problems with that. And one they mentioned in the article. The one they mentioned in the article is that people will still gravitate towards a particular seat. For instance, look at this classroom. Right. <laughs> uh, I still print a spot, and she probably felt a little upset about that. <laughs> but you know, people by and large have gravitated to the same seats each time. And then secondly, um, I think this is the ultimate way to tell your workers that we don't value you in any way, shape, or form, and you are just a cog in a machine. Yes, there is a quote coming very much along those lines. You paraphrased me in <laughs> advance. Good. Uh, Jack, I'm just ahead. curious if uh, the managers or the bosses at City had the same no uh, no designated desk policy because at my company right. there's open office for everybody except the president who got his uh, I think on the floor plans it was actually called El Jefe's Fortress of Solitude. Right. <laughs> <laughs> How far up the food chain it goes, and uh, I I do believe that in most American expressions of this movement that it does not go up to the C-level executives, but in other countries it has. Japan notably has done this in several large corporations. It's really interesting. Completely open office space, including the CEO of some very large companies. Emily, did you have your hand up? Um, just, I guess, trying to make it work. Yes, I, I do like the idea that we're kind of, let's not say that one. Right. Yeah, they go. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, it's just the cube land and conference room and just kind of go in and sit there. Right. I like this idea of having, like, I don't know, open space for people to come in and sit and do stuff. And they're actually ones where some balance has got to be good. Family? Yeah, so in, in the spirit of Citibank Financial, um, it, when I worked for a financial house, you had to start off in the bullpen and how well you did determine which office space you got. So it was an incentive to get to an office, you know, with a door. But you were all putting on, you, you all started out the same and then you, you know, worked your way out. 
Okay. So it's an easy incentive. Yeah. From my current position, we actually do kind of a, a quasi sort of plan. So you have like a, a separate office that you can retreat to with an office mate, or you can work collaboratively with your team as a functional area that's a kind of open office plan, but restricted to no more than like 20 people total. And we found that that works really well because typically in the open area, you sit with the people that are fu functionally working on the same areas that you are, and then you can just turn around and say, hey, your stuff's broken. Um, but if you need to, you can retreat to you know the fortress of solitude like El Jefe. <laughs> so we, we have people that do both. You know, one of the guys that used to be in the open area now works solely from his office unless he has to come in. Otherwise, the rest of us just sit there and squawk at each other. Right. Okay. Let's. Uh... Oh, do we have a? Okay. We'll go. Uh, sorry. Go. Um, uh, I had a couple comments. I'll just sure. keep them small. Uh, um, so um, I guess like working from home, um, I work in a manufacturing facility and always have worked in a manufacturing environment and we don't have option to work from home. And um, I see a lot of people at work show up, you know, work eight hours and they don't take any time off and I see them being exhausted and there's no way of actually measuring how much they accomplish in that eight hours. So um, as long as they're, they're fulfilling that, I mean, according to HR, it's fine, but I would like to see how much they would accomplish, you know, if they worked less, but they were like full of energy and if they could actually, you know, right. be active. In their what life. fraction of companies do you guys think have a really good handle on how productive their employees actually are individually? Terrible. Virtually universal. Terrible. They have no idea. Even, even really great companies like Google, they, they have no idea how productive their people are. They, ho they hope and dream that fantastic things fall out the back end. Um, and, and it's been true to some degree. But they've all also had some pretty colossal failures um, and ongoing. That, of course, they don't cover them as such. But you know, when you have tens of billions in the yeah. bank, it covers up for a lot of failure. Mm -hmm. I found reading uh, interesting, especially discussing Citibank creating what they call neighborhood. Uh, I can relate to this because where I work, we implemented what we called flexi offices. And it's a model where no one has an assigned desk and everyone can occupy any space he chooses to. And the aim of this was to increase collaboration among employees and reduce the number of offices, number of office desks needed. That initiative succeeded in creating a better looking office because of the investment that went into remodeling the office space. But aside from that, um, the initiative failed in its real objective. Even though there were no assigned desks, people sat in the same space spaces every day and um, employees got attached to their spaces and some even marked their territory <laughs> with personal effects. Conflict arose when someone decided to occupy a space um, which is usually occupied by someone else. I've heard of examples from friends and colleagues um, where this same system was implemented but I really haven't heard of where this model of an assigned desk um, was sustainable and it would be great to hear examples from the class where this model worked without um, a whole lot of conflict. Citibank's example in the reading said they helped individuals feel they own their space, yet no one was assigned a workspace. I really don't know how that will work uh, when individual space is a replica of all other spaces. It seemed they assumed that they can create one model and then everyone would call it theirs. And I doubt that's even realistic. In my experience, I imagine it would be better to ask employees to submit ideas on how they would um, how they would like their spaces to look. And those that are interested in in that help them to develop their space to their taste. And while at the same time maintaining the large office team, I think people will feel um, are more likely to feel like they own their spaces if they have input into its design. So he's had some experience with flex offices to increase collaboration and cut costs. So there were the same two reasons. Uh, actually, it was a little bit different. So in the city article, they wanted to cut costs. And then there was a fragmented feeling because they had all these different facilities 
Um, you guys, what do you guys think about that? What do you think the city's true motivations were um, in regards to going to the uh, open open office contest? Jack. Why are we paying rent on three buildings when we can pay rent on one? <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and so I think it would be better for city to be candid with staff and tell them they're really primarily looking to cut rent expense um, rather than um, putting it in the context of we're going to get rid of this fragmented feeling and yada yada. You think, how good do you think staff typically is at reading through that stuff? Really, really, good. Really, really, really good. good. Yep. It's hard to fool. If you hire smart people, it's really hard to fool them, unfortunately. So that, that, was, a, that was a really poor decision on city's part. Um, so better looking was the only improvement that, that Toulouse saw. Uh, people tend to take the same spot every day and they're marking their territory. Uh, so has anyone here seen this open office flex space experiment come off successfully in any place you've worked? Wow. It's not, not a ringing endorsement, is it? <laughs> okay, let's go on. Um, yeah, oh, oh, we had some, I'm sorry. You have someone online? Oh, no, I had a comment. Oh, sorry, I'm like, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> on the, the personal item that jogged something, uh, I've been reading this book on like project psychology. It's a little like you, okay, but uh, it was backed by a lot of research that, you know, positive, being positive has a lot of benefits, among which are increased performance at work and increased creativity. And so that, they even specifically pointed out the example of people who have pictures of family at work. When you see that, you get like a spike of positive emotion in your brain and those people like it actually helps work performance. Right. So by stripping away those personal items, right. you know, maybe you can have a new monitor, but like it actually is helpful and right. helps you with your work. Uh, my first job out of college was in financial services sales. Uh, and we had the room that we called the bullpen. Uh, which is where all the new hires got put as they were trying to spend as much time as they could on the phone. Yeah, it's not like it's the same environment. Uh, it was <laughs> the motivation to uh, sell was to get out of the bullpen to make it up that you could actually get always be selling. Yep. yep. Absolutely, Alan. Yeah, I have seen that those um, that the changes are not um, how can I say it are not effective when they're applied. Uh, it's more than it's. It's more that if the company really has in their core the, the this notion of making the, of making a cooperation in all, with all the teammates right. instead of just making a change, I, I think it's just cosmetic to to try to to think that magically everybody's going to work if you just put open open, open space. Sprinkle it with fairy dust and wow, it's 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 magic. But. Yeah, I definitely feel that office space is more the symptom and not the real issue. And the real issue is that there's from three jobs that I've worked at, um, that there's no real teamwork and collaboration in general between uh, people are silo siloed off like inside and whether you have open spaces or you know closed office doors, like it's not gonna work until you address those issues of collaboration and teamwork, how you can right. uh, The make culture's gonna hold back any transition that yeah. the relatively superficial changes in the physical environment might try to Accelerate, Jack. Um, one thing that I uh, liked from the article, and this might apply to Sean's situation, I think they've done a really good job of this in the ITLL is um, having your phone number and your like desktop account follow you around. Like in the ITLL, I can go to any one of those team rooms and log on, and there's like a couple files that I've saved from homework projects, and they just follow me around. I think that's pretty. Right, that's pretty slick. Um, what are we now? Omero. Uh, so not, not. I'm sorry. Um, Edgar. <laughs> I, uh, I just had a, a comment. Uh, I don't know exactly what kind of, uh, in what kind of situation this would work. Uh, in a situation where I am, I am part of an R&D group, but I have uh, a workspace and I have uh, a board and I write down stuff. I have uh, you know, calculations or, or I, I make samples, prototypes, and I have them all around. So it will be impossible. Oh, and my computer is, is different from other people's computers because the power that I need to run some software is different from others. Right. So it's just a, a completely different uh, approach. So it, this could never work in, in the environment that I, that, I, right. that I am right now. So there are all, all sorts of little inefficiencies that get introduced when you start sharing things. Uh, technology example, this is a laptop provided by the university 
for my use, but not for my exclusive use. And I am a low-level administrator on this, so I cannot download and install the software for the fairly advanced mouse I prefer to use, so I have to use the Apple touchpad thing, which makes me less efficient. It's very frustrating for me. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's lots of little things like that that uh, companies fail to anticipate. Of course, why they can't trust me to install some software is a really good question. That doesn't give me a good feeling either, does it? It's like, no. have an engineering degree, have an MBA. I might know what's a solid company whose software <laughs> I should trust. Just maybe. <laughs> Emily. It sounds like the energy touch. Someone said a couple weeks ago a question I asked them. Can staff install software themselves without getting permission? Yeah. Yeah. So do you treat them like children or do you treat them like professionals? Jeff. We had one uh, project manager who installed, uh, what is it, Kazaa and every yep. Red oh, Sox like, screensaver pop-up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, no, they can't all be trusted. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? You know, something that happens, you know, that's a really good period. You know, it would be perfectly acceptable to next performance review, man, that's a ding. It's like, you, you gotta know what you're doing, right? This is part of your job. And, and that's what probably didn't end the world for the company, but yeah. Uh, Ashwin, you have your hand? Yeah. Company where they wouldn't allow any storage devices inside. And just because of that reason, I rejected the offer. <laughs> Funny how little things, you know, it's like, yeah, even if, you, if you're making a good salary, like if, if some company was paying you $5,000 less, it probably wouldn't anger you anywhere near as much as these little annoying things that are continually reinforcing, we don't trust you, you are a cog in our machine, you, you are not empowered to do the things you need to do. Um, so you have to go into a phone booth type situation in order to make a quiet or private phone call. Problems with that? Depends on the nature of the business, right? In certain businesses, some staff are going to be doing that all the time. It's a, it's a high level sales environment. They probably have, don't have great tolerance for a lot of speech going on in the background. So it depends. Um, in certain work, work environments, that probably be a problem. Um, can office spaces encourage collaboration, sharing of ideas? Anyone? So, famous examples where the, the office itself, we have, we have one from our case, IDEO. Um, any, any other famous examples you guys are familiar with, Jack? Um, there's been a bunch of recording studio examples where artist A is working in studio A and somebody else is working in studio C and they walk by and they hear something and it's like, oh, how'd you get that sound? I really like that and they'll just fall on it. Cool. Interesting. Um, so it's kind of ironic that engineers and tech people who t somewhat lean introvert and high tech companies are spearheading this effort. So there's all sorts of work environments. Let's say, um, I don't know, customer service environments or um, other, other areas that might be more conducive to this sort of collaborative environment, you know, let's say a Virgin Atlantic, right? Um, but yet it's the, uh, the tech companies are doing it. They don't have the history, they don't have the built-in legacy systems in their heads as well as physically in their office space. So that's largely why it's happening. So the sanitary wipes in the cubicles between users. Ryan's got a comment. Oh, Ryan, go. I was thinking uh, one, it, and it could be a couple different industries, but one area where this might work is if the jobs were more prescriptive what I'm thinking of just kind of like pushing forms through or things like that where you have a very limited set of actions. So maybe even like customer service type applications where like, okay, I, I know what the next step is. I just don't have the authority to do it. And then if you had a collaborative group, uh, maybe that would increase efficiency, but probably not very much on the high end. I agree with the substance of the other comments. Right. I mean, if it's the sort of thing where you hunker down and just stay with your eyes fixed on your monitor, then you could potentially do that in sort of any physical environment. So you could save space by doing this sort of approach. Of course, you gotta wonder, it's like, you know, those sorts of environments, and even, even at the city group here, I really wonder like how much people are on vacation or traveling. It didn't seem like there was a big HR component to where they did it. It's like, well, do HR travel a lot in city group? It doesn't make a lot of sense, really. Sean. Point out that open offices are not a new idea to begin with at all. No, 
I mean, to, to look at the you know ad companies of like the 40s and 50s, I mean, that's all it was. It was just a big, giant open space with a desk. You had your, your ad copy. Now, Mad Men told me differently. The super high ups have their bar inside their private office suite, and they have a little Lake Chase lounge on the side, you know? And you, point out, you point out time that people take away from work, and I, I can anecdotally say that when I went from having a fishbowl office at one company to being in a more open office place, my sick time has gone up incredibly. Um, one person gets sick, and then 28 people oh. get it throughout the yeah. various other times. Yeah, so. yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> Emily. Um, just trying to think of places I might know, and so I went to visit JetBlue's headquarters um, soon after they opened one. They definitely designed it that it was very open, um, not open that like you know, a lot of collaboration. Right. But specifically, their big one was um, for their command center, was just like one giant room where everyone has like that just like monitor seat surrounded by literal fish tanks. If right. Say that's wrong. But it, I, they said that it was vastly improved collaboration where someone would be on the phone and someone else would call another airline because they had constantly right. negotiate. Well, especially in, in an airline industry that's constant change. Second to second change. Um, absolutely, that makes all kinds of sense. And JetBlue has a reputation for being a pretty well run company, too. So, alternative to the traditional cubicle are the bullpens. You guys already talked about that. Um, Glibbert, some thoughts on it. So, how would you choose groups? Would you put together? So, would you take four designers and put them in a bullpen, and four accounting people and put them in a bullpen? Would you break it up so you'd have cross-functional things in the same bullpen? What do you think uh, might work better? Neil. I think the uh, cross-functional will definitely work better. Just get, um, thinking back to my uh, previous job, there was just very little communication between our accounting department and, let's say, our inventory department, and the discrepancies were just crazy. <laughs> I mean, yeah. the, the two systems just didn't line up whatsoever. And then the emails start going back and forth, <laughs> and these two offices are down the hall from each other. Right. So, and you rely on emails instead of just walking down and Great thinking. example, and that's, that's yeah. super common where a lot of the sort of professional support services to the organization are largely ignorant of what goes on in the company and what its strategic levers are what it's sustainable competitive, and it kind of seems crazy to not know that, but there's actually a lot of people who work in companies who don't have a clue exactly what their company does. They have their job, they focus on it, their head's down. Um, so yeah, so, so trying to create some of that cross-pollination creativity, that's, uh, that's a good idea. Um, bullpen shares some of the other problems with um, noise and distractions um, that we've seen in, the, in all these office space examples. Um, what kind of stresses can be created by going to these from, say, conventional private office cubicle environment to these more open spaces? Patrick. Yeah, it's, um, I, I think there are a lot of stresses. I, I think that you can't really assume that everyone's going to get along with everyone. I think there's, I think everyone has coworkers that they say, you know what, it's, I am okay with working with that person, but I'd prefer not to be around them 24 hours a day. And I think in these open office spaces, you kind of run the risk of spending way too much time right. with someone you don't get along well with. Right. It's like that cousin you got, you know, it's like, yeah, it's great to see him at Christmas, but I just as soon not hang out with that guy necessarily a whole lot. <laughs> Plenty of people you can tolerate in an organization if they're not like all around you and they're overly loud voice is, is haunting you, uh, absolutely. And um, so by culture or personality, we talked about some of that, about uh, introverts, extroverts, and the type of organization going on, nature of the work being done. Obviously, some work is inherently much more creative and collaborative, and that would seem the natural fit for these sorts of physical spaces. Uh, why might be tough to investigate the benefits and costs of these various forms if you're an objective researcher? Why be hard to figure out what works and what doesn't? Josh. I think kind of as the example Neil gave, you, you can measure some of that change in less discrepancies between inventory and accounting, but in, in others, it's just going to be too hard to to capture those little interactions that go on and what efficiencies they either promote or don't promote, I guess. Right, a lot of it's tough to measure, good. Any other reasons? Oh, right. 
because I mean, beyond like looking at how your your metrics that you already use change, if at all, it's going to be hard to assign causality because every other question in that survey is going to be, how do you feel? And so the data you're going to get from that is going to be pretty garbagey. Like even if it's really strongly negative or positive, like how does that tell you anything? All right. They ask on a day after the Broncos lose, and a lot of people in the front range are going to say it's terrible. It's terrible around this place. Um, and, and another piece of the core. Oh, Kush, please. I think different uh, companies uh, have different cultures, so it's going to be very difficult to like uh, jot down similarities. Right. No, Neil, I'm good. It just depends on what you're measuring too. You can find data to support just about any claim. So if you're trying to prove that it's good, you can find data that's going to support that. If you're trying to prove it's bad, you can find data to support that. Kind of like our politics, right? Right. <laughs> we all each have our own reality. So a big piece of it is, so if you're a company, and let's say you've done one of these programs, and let's say you don't necessarily really know exactly, but you kind of have the feeling that it's not going so well with the allotted staff, and they're not so happy about it, and then some research team from a well-respected university wants to start surveying them. What are you likely to say if it was your job to, and you made the decision to install that new office system? You're unlikely to grant access, aren't you? So that's gonna skew the whole thing, right? You're not gonna get any of the real disaster data points. Um, they're, they're actively filtered out. Um, we talked about uh, cities' motivations. So uh, there's also an ongoing trend about companies trying to go completely paperless. How might that interact with these new forms of physical space? Fairly obvious. Not have printers and scanners all around. Yeah, Printing that's that's machines. a piece. Printing machines. Yeah, Jack. Yeah, less uh, less space taken up, and um, there's actually a, a company here in Boulder. Um, uh, oblong and they make these conferencing systems where you have a special room that's built and it's like your data manipulation talk with the office in China kind of room so it's a whole right. other type of I guess paradigm for office space right so I, um, at my last job we had offices that were in different buildings and we were a very paper-based company and a highly regulated company so Going to sleep on me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so just to get approvals and signatures from people, it used to take forever. I mean, I feel like um, right. it's like kind of, yeah. Right. Well, Ed, Alan. Well, um, I experienced in, my, in one of my companies that they were one of the companies that had more, uh, be, uh, the, one of the best implementations of Salesforce in Mexico. Uh, they're very good. Uh, we didn't have a lot of paper, but also uh, after that I went to another company that didn't have a clue of how to implement Salesforce and the problem was terrible. So yeah. if you're going to make an implementation in that sense, you have to go through all the way mm. and be ready that maybe that could take you two or five years even. Yeah. People can carry their all their work on their their laptop. It's not like yeah. a, what it used to be. I remember my dad's office when I was little. It was file cabinet after file cabinet. Right. If you never have to access a physical file, you can do your work anywhere. So it's actually a big thing. Um, those things are kind of interrelated to some some degree. Uh, so how do you physically find someone at City? Did the article even speak to that? No. So you, you want to need to find Bob or Lorraine, and how the heck do you find them? Is there some like real time they got a GPS tracker <laughs> on them within the office, and you can see where they're currently sitting today? So, yeah, <laughs> kind of spooky though. The privacy concerns yeah, Tim's. Well, if everybody just keeps grabbing the same seats, then maybe it's not that hard. Well, that's that's not, that's probably one of the reasons. Why it's like it's like I, I get so frustrated when I can't find you, especially like supervisor. Your supervisor tells you they get frustrated because they can't find you. Guess what? You're gonna keep your butt in the same seat. Yeah, um, Cisco makes a product, um, I think it's called Unified Presence, where you can actually see if somebody's at their desk or not. So if you pick yeah. up uh, your phone Do number. Do you know how it does it? Yeah, so like if you if you pull up on your directory, Yash, it'll have like a little icon that says he's either there or not. And but how is it sensing the presence? Um, it's sensing by whether they're logged into their, their phone, their computer, instant messaging. Um, you could be logging in your computer and be long gone, though. That? You can be logged into your computer and not be there. <laughs> yeah, sure. It's like when you're on instant messenger and you work from home and then you need to go walk the dog and you just 
Yeah. But they talked about, you know, they, in the city article, they were, so they were building the neighborhoods, right? Well, they, they kind of had it to be that way, so that you at least have a clue where the certain person in HR you needed to talk to, at least being sort of this part of the building, there was, there was really no option. Um, so, sweet spot between interruption-based inefficiency and anti-collaboration, I we already talked to a lot of those issues, we'll move on. Uh, so, evidence against the open office thing. This is the Australian researchers kind of shot a big hole in the whole city thing. So, what do you think? Do you think, think the Australian, for those who read the Australian article, who do you think, think they got it right, think city's right? Sean. So, I actually pulled up her paper and her conference paper for this. I'd just like to point out that the um, age that she, the, the median age was uh, 46 with a standard deviation of 12. So, it kind of makes me wonder what would happen if you start doing this study with uh, different age groups and how do you feel about it? Because it was just, you know, as we right. discussed earlier, how do you feel about this right. and that was the questionnaire. You might, if you had a, a, a younger cohort that had not transitioned from a period of conventional office systems largely into this, that they, they had less uh, emotional attachment to the legacy system, say, you might get a much more positive reaction to it. Ab absolutely. Any other thoughts? Say it. There could also be a difference between work cultures in, you know, Australia versus... You know, absolutely, city. could be. Australia is not not too far from the U.S. culturally, but but a, absolutely, there could be. Any any, any other thoughts? Because the, the article was was pretty dang critical of the whole concept. Mm -hmm. uh, the response they got was not only are people less happy, they're actually less productive. Um, so the best option they were saying was with uh, sharing space with one or two colleagues and autonomy over the work environment. Yep, we, we've uh, all been leaning that direction. So there's been, and about working from home, we talked about that a little bit. Uh, anyone know about a famous leading executive CEO woman who's had a lot to say on this topic? The, Tim? The buyer in uh, Yahoo? Yeah. Tim? So. Uh, yeah, she came out and said, basically, nobody can work from home. Everybody has to be in the office, which was, Sounded like it was pretty counter to Yahoo's policy. Right. So this was bringing Yahoo into the 21st century. No one could work from home anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Is that, was that really the strategy? Because Yahoo's a failed company. Anymore? <laughs> oh, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yahoo's a failure. So, yeah. <laughs> so is that really a, I want to bring it in, or is that a, a good way to do a riff and say, you know, the people that can't come in anymore will be um, I think it's, I, in my mind, it's really an expression of desperation. Um, so when you take over these, and, then, and again, this is a scenario where you have a mature business, and it should really just be managed for expenses and to try to churn uh, and generate as much return for investors as you can with the business you have left. Going on all these wild acquisitions and trying to turn around and head back to the you know, growth revenue models that the company had 15, it's, it's not going to happen. It's fantasy land. But the United States and the equity markets can't accept a mature to declining business, even if it's making money. They can't accept it. So everyone has to fantasize about the massive growth rate. So that's essentially the job she was given, guaranteed to fail, uh, essentially from the outset to my mind. But there's a lot of hypocrisy in, um, in these areas around, um, I believe she, she did, was, it, she, was she the executive who built a childcare center for her kid at her workplace? Yeah, so while no one can work from home anymore, oh, I'm about to have a kid, so I'm gonna build a child care center in the building. Must be nice to be the CEO. It's pretty dang hypocritical. So, and uh, a great lesson from uh, family housing and public housing. So this is New York City public housing. This is just as a kid where you'd wanna grow up, right? This is perfect, it's ideal for small children and young families, right? <laughs> Lovely environment. You watch Timmy, you know, playing with the ball in the grass. Oh, there's no grass, and no, you can't because you're eight stories up. It's really insanely bad. So they actually built a lot of these things with nail-proof concrete. I, go ahead, Emily. That's because, like, I live in the graduate family housing here, and we moved in, and we're like decorating or putting stuff up, and some walls we could put stuff up. Some walls, we go to like put it in the nail bed. Like, no, <laughs> mess that up. Let's try. Nope. It. It's concrete. Yeah, 
Yeah, and, and so I actually, um, you know, I worked in the real estate industry for a long time and I had occasion to meet one of the top people of the New York City Housing Administration and he was uh, expressing to me how proud he was that they had gone to this nail-proof concrete so that you know the transitions between tenants were so much smoother and all this because you really wouldn't want to let this nice older woman put these picture of her grandkids and great grandkids up on the wall. That would be terrible. So is it any wonder, so in the way that you get a negative employee reaction when you get shoehorned into an environment that you can't impact yourself, you can't adjust for yourself, you don't own it, it's not yours, that you get a huge negative reaction and those reactions in public housing tended to be a lot of vandalism. It's a, it's a natural human reaction, could be completely anticipated by the approaches they took. Contrast, another New York City uh, housing project. So they, the smart folks started actually not finishing the units. And between tenants, they wouldn't finish the units. They'd get the new tenants in, and they'd get a contractor there, and they would make the tenant fi help finish the unit. Actually do physical labor, painting, whatever they could handle, the contractor would guide them. Because guess what? When they spent their own time doing something, they're really unlikely to damage it. It's really common sense. And so the <laughs> same thing could be applied to these office environments. You have to give people a piece of ownership in some way or sense, or you're just making them feel alien, like they don't belong, like you don't really want them there. And this was IDO, right? So IDO has the, uh, the free form office space thing going, but you can see that there's all sorts of physical stuff and personal things that have started to sort of backtrack on that. So that sort of approach is kind of setting an open environment and being flexible. So in places when they, when they want to sort of partially personalize their space, even if they're not necessarily entitled to have this desk spot every day, that's sort of theirs, and they're normally there, but hey, if they're on vacation or something and someone else wants to use it, that's great. <laughs> so, you know, some balance, some collaboration, empowering your staff to some degree, that's what's really the best solution to date. And we'll take a break. Oh, oh and I've got, I've got a snack. <laughs> Target and buy the like sticky <laughs> book things. Yeah. Great. Uh-oh. But he's not really telling me it's the I like my Anybody wants an orange or granola bar? I'm gonna have an orange. Mommy doesn't like that. Orange one. heard my undergrads like complaining about being so hungry and I was like, oh, well, I go to buy snacks for myself. It's like, I'm at Costco. <laughs> it costs much cheaper. Great oranges is like eight bucks. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we're going to hear each other's issues and clear. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, pushing you to yourself. What was it? I'm sorry, take it. I was pushing you to bring your own meal because that's the system recording the video you had. So the yeah. effect is that you're recording again. You were pushing the recording to me. So when I do this. Don't, okay, I don't get what you're saying. Okay, Colorado. <laughs> 80 today, 40 tomorrow. I can see yourself. But somehow, like, this year is oh, yeah. amazing. Because, I mean, it's not, it's not been cold, no. like, since, like. I only saw the slides up there. But it's probably going to be a longer winter than. Oh, yeah, yeah, one, but yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, I did, yes, I did. Yeah. Probably going to be snowing in May. I hope not. <laughs> Yeah, so, <laughs> yes, I this every year that it, it wasn't okay. considered this. That's just bad. Okay. Yeah. Are you flying back for Thanksgiving? Uh, we're actually driving to my parents in Nebraska. Nebraska? Sweet. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep. Still a long drive. It's like seven.
about you? I'm gonna be taking okay. off to New I'll York deal. on uh, yeah Wednesday you said midnight. You, yeah. You said you're Take an orange or a granola bar if you want. City. Uh, New Jersey, the uh, yeah. Hobo, Hoboken. I want it from Jersey every day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah, seven next minutes. Two weeks. <laughs> we're gonna have to the city. Well, we'll see. We're gonna vote but on yeah. free pizza next week. You ever seen that episode? Do you watch Futurama at all? Uh, I have watched it a few times, yes, but not religiously. No, there's an episode where I bet. <laughs> Uh-huh. Sorry, Ashwin, I didn't hear you. Mm-hmm. Where are they in Tennessee? Amazing. Uh, University of Tennessee. Yeah, there's only one thing. It's, uh, we're technically in Jersey. Yeah, they told me to like, pick the pizza, the pizza place, and I'll call them up and give them a credit card number, I guess. So, yeah. Yeah, people really pick on people from New Jersey. You know, like, it's a joke. It's a running joke, you know, like, New Yorkers are constantly bringing people down and yeah, putting my, people down. My favorite, so I went to, I went to the city five day conference. Yeah. Oh, time, yeah. I was spending real time in the yeah. city. And uh, I was in Manhattan, but I was taking the, the train back to the airport <coughs> in New Jersey. And uh, my favorite thing was seeing at like in the morning, mm-hmm. the girls in like their like, party clothes from the night yeah. before. Uh-huh. And like, them all sneering and <laughs> exhausted, just like hanging out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's really funny. If you go to, like, New York City, I mean, the thing is, you go to other boroughs of New York, you know, Brooklyn, Queens. I mean, they're kind of far from, like, Manha- Manhattan. You can find places that are in New-, New Jersey that are closer to Manhattan, but they always put down people from Jersey. You know? they were, <laughs> you're from Jersey. Worse, I grew up in Vermont, and we hated everybody from the like Massachusetts Vermont. South. Yeah, really. <laughs> yeah. thing coming out to see the colors change. Or just <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're for the Flatlanders to come up for the foliage <laughs> and the skiing. <laughs> the foliage, <laughs> massive eye roll. And now my brother lives in New Jersey. Oh, the irony is. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? So, one of the things I never understood is this hate thing be- between Texans and the people of Oklahoma. Do they really? I've never heard yes. of Yes. <laughs> oh, come on. There, there are little jokes about it. <laughs> but, but for me, it's like. That's why. That's just the way. Yeah. Yeah, I'm paying it for that. I got him off it. Back, you're backwards. No, you're backwards. <laughs> I've never heard of that. Hey, yeah, even, even Texas says that the, that the, the, the real uh, law should not be. Yeah. It should be in the Oklahoma law. <laughs> <laughs> Alberta, everybody in British Columbia yeah, hates the Albertans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that, that makes sense. They're so opposite. Completely really opposite. Even the Canadians refer to British Columbia as the British Columbia. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. More, 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 more yes. Uh, Californians would be like the ice. I guess in like the light west coast compared to the people of British Columbia. Well, British Columbia is pretty pop proper. You know, their signs say, their signs say slippery when frosty. We're not yeah. gonna have classes next week, but extremely I heard cold, that yeah. the university is still gonna be open political next week. Right. Yeah. Okay. So you're gonna be, you know, coming in for work and stuff. Yeah, I'll be here Monday through Wednesday and then uh, take Thursday, Friday off. That sucks. But, you know, yeah. Well, it, it's kind of nice because it'll be quiet. And yeah, I'll have few interruptions. Yeah. So I'm really looking forward to getting. Oh yeah. I'm but sure I thought if you work for the university, that you could get the whole week off. Yeah. Without class, that would be sweet. Did you get tickets? Did you decide yeah, did. to go back? Yeah, I did. Um, Darn. <laughs> I'll be back Sunday morning, though. Yeah. Well, definitely now that the simulation's over for us, <laughs> we can probably take some time out. Write that damn paper. Get that off. I probably shouldn't say that out loud because other people might be. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really small. It's I'm going to aim for the five and a half percent, you know, like points. It told you, all right, thanks for playing, but you don't need to do any more. big sign, like written um, mic, you know, well, really I think we could probably, if we. I, I think we could play on. That's what tech support well, said. We could play on until well, quarter twelve. The simulation will allow you to play, even though you're negative in your cash flow. Um, so they advise. Or you doing yourself? You know, <laughs> I'm wondering what would happen if we didn't submit like any decisions like for a quarter and just submitted it just like that. How would it affect our revenues and stuff? 
I don't know. Yeah. I really want to run our company <laughs> into the ground. <laughs> you know, I think we're pretty much there. <laughs> no, I, think really we can, I, think we can, I think we can <laughs> go down. But there are no <laughs> soldiers. <laughs> I like your attitude. You're better. Yeah, my so, I like small mile small mile north. <laughs> yeah, it is still. Yeah, I really want to go north down. Bernard, can you grab a napkin? Probably 30 to 50 percent of the cars. I was telling Syed, I think it was quarter eight. I'm like, just everything on black. Let's just try to crash this thing. <laughs> and then he's like, no, no, no. Wish came true. Have Mexican plates on it. The what? <laughs> the amount of Mexican time, like, it, looking at the data and stuff. It took a lot. Yeah, European lot plates are, like, time. a lot different. Yeah, yeah. Wait, where we were, like, they're, like, the same as the U.S. I just... I think I came up with my own <laughs> algorithm for, like, this, for this thing, for the simulation, because I was thinking... I think I kind of figured out, like, the code on how to... Hot outside, almost. Yeah, but, I mean, it's just too much data, but, you know. I know, right? Yeah. Has it always been like this in Colorado? Yeah, the change of season. I watched that movie recently by Leonardo. Spend more time with the Yes, I can. Like, kind of but now that we get snow, no. well, I'm just hoping it holds yeah. the barn. Yeah. All right, the well, actor of Leonardo DiCaprio. Snow was supposed to be rain, right? Yeah. I heard it was supposed to be snow. Well, I've heard snow and mountains rain, rain here, I think. Really? They're on Netflix, right? Like no, it's there. Yeah. Crash my house here. <laughs> as long as it's dry on Sunday so I can ride. Right. <laughs> Before the that's good. It's the, way I, it's the way I feel too, except I, my, my beast of burden is metallic. Uh, <laughs> a steel steed. Yeah, the snow in the evening rain. Okay. Yeah, I thought the precipitation trailed off by uh, the time it got really cold. It's got like an inch or two tomorrow, I think. Yeah. Seriously? Oh, uh, no. Okay. It'll be gone, so it's Colorado. So yeah, it'll melt really quick. Yeah. Get back up to 70. Let's get rolling again. You guys can uh, continue to uh, eat nibble, no problem. Oh, so um, you know, one of the things about the glitch from Marketplace Live is that they made this offer about pizza. And uh, so we could make an addendum to our last week's potluck, or as an alternative, we could, for week 14, is have pizza week 14. Um, and uh, we could have that brought in or, you know, have it delivered or, uh, yeah, or, or, or Yash suggested going for pizza after class 14 uh, nearby. We could do that too. Um, let's take a, let's take a vote. So let's say uh, four, no, let's say three options. Um, pizza in class next week, pizza after class physically at uh, a restaurant. Sorry? Beer. <laughs> so, uh, is everyone comfortable being around alcohol? I wouldn't want to exclude anyone. Mm -hmm. Is that cool? Yeah, oh, yep. I absolutely yep. hate alcohol. <laughs> 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 That's it. Um, if you stay. Okay. Um, so, options. So, pizza here, pizza afterwards with a, with a, with a place that maybe serves a beer or two. Or make it a den of get like a, uh, a taco bar to add to our final potluck to make it even bigger. So, who would go for pizza in class? All of them. All of them, yeah. <laughs> pizza after class next week. This would be a good round. Adding food to our final potluck. That sounds great. Yeah. yeah. And, and we, we do a runoff. Number two. So how they think it's like two up. options. Could do yeah. a runoff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, like you have two big How'd options, you could do a runoff. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, uh, let's see. So if you have to choose between... Pizza after class tomorrow or adding like tomorrow. tacos to the potluck. Who wants potluck bigger? A few. For my potluck. Pizza after class next week. <laughs> Wait, well, pizza after class, yeah. After class. It's really, it's really, really <laughs> even. It's really hard. <laughs> I don't know. So it's going to be on the. I don't want to hold. Right. Uh, right. right. That would be the. But uh, there are two separate things. I mean, Marketplace Life is going to do something for us separately, and we yeah. have to do our own thing separately. I thought we had two things. Yeah. <laughs> we got 
<laughs> the public didn't have anything to do with the Marketplace Live fund, so. Right, now I'm just saying what we could do with the money is go get pizza or order like, you know, from Illegal Pete's order tacos and have that added to the potluck. But we can't do both. Uh, unless you're feeling generous, Emily. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of stock outs last quarter. I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, go for, let's go for pizza next time, okay? Mm -hmm. let's, I'll settle it. I'll, yep. I'll break the tie. I vote pizza, pizza next time. So that's, that's what we're doing. And I will take nominations for the joint. Uh, it, there is a bit of a tradition in the EMIT program to go to the No Name Bar, which is yep. on the hill right nearby. Um, you get the pizza right next door. They don't actually make it there, but you can order it there. Um, it's kind of a quiet place. If you don't want to run into anyone uh, hanging out with this crowd, you know, you wouldn't want to be seen. It's a good place for that. It's kind of in the corner. <laughs> no name bar. <laughs> quiet. <laughs> okay. So, so if you guys want to nominate a different a different place to go, that's fine. Shoot me an email. Take it under advisement. On 30th or December? Yeah, I'll be the 30th for the pizza, and then the potluck will be on the 7th. The week after, on the 7th. Right, because there's no pot yet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is the best class ever. <laughs> right. And more people need to chime in on Google Plus on the potluck. I will take, I will pick last. I'll take whatever we need. Um, if we need entree, believe it or not, I can actually do that. Um, I, can, I, I, I can only make three things, but they're, all of them are good. What you do at Intertech is you take the specifications from the customer Human resources. and you bring them down to the software engineers. Yes, y yes, uh, that's, that's right. Well, then I just have to ask, why couldn't the customers just take them directly to, to the software people, huh? Well, uh, I'll tell you why. Uh, because engineers are not good at dealing with customers. He's an engineering manager. So <laughs> you physically take the specs from the customer well, <laughs> no, my, my secretary does that, or the fax. Oh. <laughs> so then you must physically bring them to the software people. Well, no. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sometimes. <laughs> what, what would you say you do here? <laughs> well, well, look, I already told you. I deal with the goddamn customers so the engineers don't have to. I have people skills. I am good at dealing with people. Can't you understand that? What the hell is wrong with you people? <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Great, great scene. <laughs> Love that one. All right, so human resources. The human economy, if you remember that article. So. What work jobs can be automated today and what's going to be automated in the near future? What sorts of things are we in the process of automating in industry right now? Right. Repetitive tasks. Good. A little more specificity. Alan. Yeah, the so manufacturing jobs, especially those manufacturing jobs that involve a high scale production. So. Right. Like a lot of welding on yes. metal fabrication, for example. Good. Emily? Yeah, I mean, just to be back on uh, like data entry jobs, a lot of things you use for like depending on where you go. Like, right. some, are, some are more up on it than others. Yeah. Ashwin, did you have your hand? Yeah, there are certain jobs where humans have uh, limitations, like working in data centers where the temperature is really huge and they have the maintenance issues in the air conditioners, they, they can be replaced by robots. And security, where human life can be saved by replacing the robot. Right, Tim. As far as customer-facing uh, food service and uh, customer service is starting to give us an example, <clears throat> uh, the rise of the self-order machines at McDonald's and places like that, just replacing <laughs> actual order takers behind the counters. Right, absolutely. Brenna. Um, I saw a restaurant which was. Something like a um, chefless kitchen. Pizza? In India. Pizza. So it's coming up in Bangalore, by the way. But <laughs> so chefless kitchen. So the entire kitchen works without a single chef. 
So that's interesting. Wow, that, that is really interesting. That's <laughs> that's very automated. So things like, um, you know, scale baking of bread. I mean, that's completely automated at this point in time. Human hands don't touch that bread. It's uh, pretty astounding. That's that's uh, coming up pretty good. So we're quickly, and of course, there's talk in the near future about artificial intelligence being able to write code, which is starting to make certain people in Silicon Valley a little nervous, people who make really good salaries right now. Um, they're, so they're thinking that in the not too distant future, at least some of the more rote uh, processes in, in writing computer code could be done um, with artificial intelligence. So what, uh, so what sorts of skill areas could never be automated? Just conceivably right now, Alan. Um, decision making, decision making, design, uh, areas when you have to actually analyze, interpret, and take a decision. Good. Ashwin. Marketing. Yeah, marketing's a big one. <coughs> Pamela. Medical profession. Medical, you're right. <coughs> I guess uh, a lot of R&D, uh, a lot of creative, innovative product design right. areas. Fundamental research and core creativity. Good. Tim? Uh, I hate to say it, but as far as, um, like, the AI could never get to, I don't know how much actually is out there. There's a lot of decision-making stuff that seems to make a lot more sense by computers. Uh, a lot of the other creative things could come up. I mean, right. theoretically, like, when the singularity happens, we're not going to be able to keep up with the robots, right? Like, we right. Don't that's right. And, and, and it's not fantasy land. You know, Elon Musk is an extremely bright man who is one of the leaders cautioning on this. And to some degree, there's also a gray fuzzy zone you might think about, about what's possible to automate or to hand over to computers, and then what we might never be comfortable handing over to computers. Those are two different things. Um, and a lot of decision making corporate decision making, that's actually an area where today you even could automate a lot of those decisions. But of course things like when to launch the nuclear weapons and things like that, we probably don't want to hand over to the machines because then we're in Skynet and Terminator <laughs> and things get very ugly very quickly. Ryan. Um, a cool example from, from the medical uh, field, I don't disagree um, that, that it'll ever be totally automated, but with looking at x-rays and diagnosing some forms of cancer from films, I've actually heard that some new technologies are like orders of magnitude better than people. Um, so that's really cool. But scarily enough, um, the, the nuclear launch codes and things like that, that is automated. Like if you, if you wanna launch a first strike that can be initiated by people, but that's actually already happened. There's some guy in, in Russia somewhere who got demoted because he overrid uh, the system uh, when it was going to launch some strike. So it, it actually is already highly automated, which is kind of scary. Well, they, uh, they, uh, God, I, hope, I, I hope the Russians don't actually have that truly fully automated where depending on where our aircraft carriers are, where aircraft is, that they automatically launch? Is that, is that what the We do. We have the exact same thing. It's just we, there's like a dead man switch that like – there's human operators that are supposed to override it. But um, the, the scary thing is it's been that way since I think like the 60, late 60s, early 70s, where like there's these detections of the, what are supposed to be plumes of launches. And that's what like the satellites are interpreting and saying, right. holy crap, are all the humans already dead? Right. <laughs> fire back. Yeah, I've read so, data on how, yeah. how often they are um, read inaccurately to the, yeah. Uh, yeah, certain weather events tend to trick the machines, et cetera. Really frightening stuff. <laughs> Hand up. Uh, I was just gonna, oh, Jack. Uh, uh, as far as creative stuff go, I think it was MIT had a uh, nightmare machine that used AI to like mix all these images together and make scary pictures. So, I mean, it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so horror films maybe, they all, they all kind of have the same plot anyway, right? <laughs> you interchange the faces and the appearance of the, of the participants, yeah. So, um, is it possible we are underestimating the possibility here? Could machines nearly do it all? So uh, we've kind of been through that. Implications for human labor and income distribution. What is this going to mean for people? So already we're kind of in an era where this is starting to hit home. Sean. There's already been talk about the universal basic income. People that are displaced from the workforce would have a guaranteed salary of X. 
um, and then they could do as they wish. The idea is that they'd still have autonomy because they could spend it as if they were making that money. They wouldn't be out on their butts because machines are doing everything. Right. So I, people that are highly skilled probably will have a lot of work, but the people that don't have those kind of skill sets might have a hard time, you know, finding right. work. Highly skilled at what, though? I mean, labor. I mean, just looking at what's happening in the in this era right now, where you know manufacturing's really gone down. I see a lot of people that are unemployed, and you know they're saying that you know they probably need to enhance their skill set if they want to get some work because. Otherwise, there's just not enough work for them. The question is, are, are there actually jobs waiting for people ready to acquire skill sets, ones that could be acquired in a year or two? Are there jobs waiting for those people in the United States? Tim. I talked to a guy last night who runs a program uh, teaching coding to inmates. Um, to work. Okay. Emily. Um, going on our medical discussion, there are a ton of, like, fairly well-paying tech jobs in the medical Having MRI machines pays fairly well in the United States. Um, and that's short. Really? Demand for that. It's kind of surprising. You'd think, you'd think yeah, that, 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 that would be pretty highly desired and pretty reliable job that would be very attractive for a lot of folks. That's surprising. Sean? You take this argument to its extreme and you assume that machines can do almost anything that human labor used to do, then basically your income distribution comes down to the people who owned those companies mm -hmm. in the first place that started gaining that. So essentially you would see two classes of society. You would see those that have pretty much all of the wealth, and then you would see us, the unwashed masses, that then have hunger games against each other. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and what's driving, and this is, this is definitely a, a process that is ongoing, and make no mistake, it has been occurring for some time and continues to march on, and that's why our middle class is so gutted out. Um, but there, you know, there's an ongoing um, tr uh, fundamental economic trend that underlies this whole mechanism, and that is that the uh, market reward for uh, labor relative to capital keeps going down. Even if you are a knowledge worker, even if you are a relatively high-end knowledge worker, everyone in this room, your relative value versus investment capital over time, long term, is trending down. So it's people who have a lot of capital to invest, who are increasingly garnering more and more and more of the economic output of our nation or planet as a whole. And there doesn't seem to be anything that's likely to change that. So it's actually not fantasy land that you could have a world where there's basically a very small number of billionaires and there hardly isn't anyone below a very sort of subsistence level of income. It's not completely fantasy land. That's why, that's why you have a different electoral college and a popular vote. <laughs> well, that's, that's other historic reasons, right? But, it, but it, it, does, it, it does also throw a big wrench in this notion that you know, skill plus effort equals reward. No, this is about who had the money to start with. That's, that's what it's about. Um, so that, that kind of throws a wrench at our whole notion of a meritocracy and, and making it big as a super bright engineer in the first place. Something to think about anyway. So do you buy, uh, buy this economic theory of evolution from agrarian to industrial to knowledge and now we're going to go on to the human thing that's going to be all important. What do you think? That was sort of the core of the, of the article. Is that, does that make sense? Skeptical? Alan. Um, I think that we can go to the human economy, but the problem is, uh, is nothing for granted. Uh, we'll have to push to do all these changes to, in order to fit into that and avoid the, this uh, apocalypse view that you already described. Right. Pamela. As an economist, yes. Um, I mean, we're classically trained about this progression, but in terms of the human factor, the human economy, it's kind of like you, what you say. In economics, one of the things we study is immigration on economy. And so you do get, you know, you may have a, a group of immigrants that come in and they take low paying jobs, but then the next wave of immigrants then depresses those wages and it just goes down and down and down. So um, I, do, I do buy it, but it's inherently, like you say, it, 
trends downward and then what? It's I mean, a leveraging system, right? The lower, you know, race to the bottom. Where do you go from the bottom? <laughs> yeah. right. so, okay. Uh, could, it'll loop right back around to agrarian, you know, so. It, it could, yeah, if we get some of those launches <laughs> and, and we get like a brief nuclear winter, we could go completely back to agrarian <laughs> society too. Uh, parts of Detroit seem to be going back to agrarian. Right, you could, you could make an argument that there's um, some difficulty there. The subsistence living, <laughs> exactly. you know, so yeah, we, right. we talk a lot about that in our models in yeah. economics. Scary stuff. So, uh, could it be that analytical intelligence is required? This is this is this is just me putting on my thought. There is it, that. So the the knowledge economy and the analysis capacity and the intellect are required but insufficient in the future. As I think, I think you have to layer on top of the the knowledge based worker. You have to add the human intelligence to really achieve a high level of success going forward. Do you think companies are actually recruiting for these sort of emotional intelligence? high human order skills? Are they, is this what companies are doing now generally? Are they clued into this or not so much? Tim. I think some companies are really clued into it. Uh, not all, I mean some obviously have no idea. Right, anyone been through an interview process recently? Got a bunch of touchy feely questions, Emily. Oh, well, not, not in the interview process, but some companies are looking into this. Actually, um, not a huge industry yet, but there's, companies out there that make online tests that you can go through and what's your AI and then, so, because I worked with um, HR recruiting, so a lot of recruiting companies, the good ones would make you go through those tests and they would, before they asked you technical skills, they would bet you is a small fraction. Yeah. Of our, like, even of our client base, like small fraction. That uses it, yeah. And that's my experience is that there's a certain number of companies that have really bought into this thing and are implementing it, but it's a tiny fraction of the whole base of employment in the country. Jack. Uh, so at my old company, I think we, we kind of knew that we should, but had no clue how. We would make new hires take those um, tests and be like, oh, well, here's their like personality profile. Like, now what? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Data, no idea how to implement it. <laughs> Alan. Yes, well, actually, um, I was talking of something very similar to a human resources recruiter, and she told me that uh, you, you need to run a full anthropological study to the candidates, and maybe that could take two or three days interview. So are you willing to, uh, the companies are willing well, to pay for that and invest the time and the resources to, to implement it? Right, so if you're a company that's, let's say, running huge call centers and taking customer service calls, there's no way that's gonna make economic sense. But if you're Google, yeah, they already do that. Their interview process lasts like days and days and weeks and weeks or however long it lasts. Yeah, so, so there are companies out there doing it. Um, companies employing human factors more in product and service design. Have they taken this stuff and actually expressing it in their products or services? What do you think? Yeah, that's kind of my reaction too. No, not really. Not, not really happening. So, you know, while, while everyone likes to talk a good game and we have, you know, the masters of the universe, the guys who come out of Harvard Business School and, and other top business schools, it's like, what actually, where the rubber hits the road, there's not so much strategic, high-level, cutting-edge implementation of things. There's a lot of playing it safe and sticking with the way things have been done for quite a while. Tim. Uh, yeah, my company within the last couple of years developed uh, PDGs, the product development and governance process, and decided to fairly recently stick human factors earlier in the process, which caused a bunch of projects that were in flight to fail because they had not been planning on doing human factors that early and failed and then had to start basically back from the beginning. But that was really sort of a forced change coming from regulatory environments saying you have to deal with this stuff earlier. Um, so right. It wasn't really a willing change. It wasn't a strategic decision. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Kind of an interesting thing that I read earlier today um, that's pertinent is Oxford English Dictionary announced their word of the year and it was post-truth. So the whole <laughs> idea that we're beyond what fact is, and now it's how does it make you feel, and that's that's kind of what that refers yeah. to. H having having how human, unpredictable, inconsistent uh, human beings basing strategies and approaches and 
large scale decision making that impacts many, many lives on how someone feels moment to moment is utterly frightening from my perspective and, and probably from, from most thinking people. So if these changes need to, uh, to be implemented at the top of the organizations to be successful, any anecdotes about executive suite that might argue for or against human intelligence in the sea level? So what I'm thinking here is, have you heard great stories? There was a great story about the, in the, uh, in the first article about the Southwest pilot. Any interesting stories you've heard about executives and companies, either on both sides, either doing something that was a complete disaster from uh, an emotional intelligence or human perspective or something that was really great? Perna. So There was this uh, uh, Hindi movie called Neerja. It's based, about, based on this um, um, pilot, no, no, pilot, what was she? Hijacked. She was an air, air hostess. Uh, so she kind of lost her life, making sure that 300 lives were saved. So that's a really brave thing to do. And she, she literally got an award and everything for that. Because, you know, cool. big, big thing. That's great. Yeah. Any, 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 remember any stories of disaster, CEOs behaving badly, doing really horrible, insensitive things? Folks that have had to resign or hang their heads in shame. Jack. Uh, there's an interesting documentary about 3D printing that was on Netflix a while ago. And uh, I think it's MakerBot, or the company that makes MakerBot mm -hmm. 3D printers. And they're, uh, uh, they have that typical um, startup to like real you know, grown-up company story. And their, their CEO kind of, the power went to his head. And he kind of didn't really use any human intelligence. He just said, I'm a... I'm the decider, and I'm going to fire everybody else who's not making money. Right. Yeah, and so, I mean, you could take one, one famous example is when um, after, oh, what would the time frame have been? Late 80s, I want to say, to early 90s, when all the tobacco CEOs were called before Congress to testify. And under oath, they all swore there was no connection between smoking cigarettes and cancer. And every single one of them knew that they had been spending millions of dollars funding bogus scientific research to create doubt around that fact. Some of the things going on with climate change these days. Um, so that's a really classic example of really terrible not thinking about the human consequences. Oh, yeah, you know, the only problem with my product is it kills my customers long term. But you know what? I get them for 30, 40 years in the meantime, so I guess that's okay. <laughs> Gallup poll of more than a million workers. Bad boss or supervisor is the number one reason people quit jobs. Anyone ever quit a job for a terrible boss? <laughs> okay, good. Mm -hmm. So... Think the U.S. might be sort of ahead or behind the global average adoption rate for human intelligence issues. What? What do you think? Do you think the U.S. tends to be more progressive on this stuff, more conservative? What do we think, Emily? There's too much competition, and like, yeah. Yeah. Really bad. Yeah. Alan. For as long as I can perceive, uh, maybe in particular companies, you're going ahead. But in general, the U.S. is getting behind. But it's understandable because the size of the country is right. so big compared to Sweden or Switzerland. Right. Well, why should the size of the country have an impact on what an individual corporation might be doing in that regard? Well, you have three, 300 million people here. Yeah. So uh, it's more difficult to run a country because you have all these huge uh, branches of the government and... Oh, government. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm thinking about corporations. And, and also operations. the corporations. Okay. So you have to make everything moves and it's like trying to to move a big elephant. Okay. Cool. Tim. Yeah, I think I mean, along the lines of just it being a huge country, I think there's a big range here. Uh, I would agree that on the whole, I think the U.S. is probably a bit behind, but I think we probably have some of the most innovative companies in the world right. that, uh, that do this well. Individual stars, absolutely, but overall, we're kind of behind the curve. And I think that's probably largely driven by, you know, our, our financial markets are so intensely impatient. They tend to be, uh, have more patience in Europe or even far more, you know, Japan is the prototypical example of, of having a lot more patience. 
And so high level executives aren't under such short to midterm pressure to perform and the natural human reaction to those kinds of pressures is caution. And you, caution and implementing cutting edge stuff here doesn't work together. So that's largely the mechanism at play there. So that CEOs making rational decisions relative to the pressures being put on them by the shareholders and their board. Say it. Yeah, um, I think the US is pretty much behind, I would say. And I was reading a few articles about you know, like how people do not want to take vacation time because they might not want their bosses to think that they're slacking off. Right. Essentially, about 40 or 50 percent of American people do not use their two-week vacation time when most other, when a lot of European countries actually offer more and they actually utilize it. People over here, they don't get enough in the first place and then they don't take time off. Right. And um, people are not valued as much, uh, I think. I mean, I guess it can differ from company to company, but I guess right. on a whole, you know, yeah. Right. Tim. Yeah, it seems like there's too much fear. Like fear yeah. of not thinking that you're working hard enough, fear of not hitting quarterly numbers, fear of upsetting the, the shareholders. Right. Uh, and it's more sort of an, an abstract fundamental issue, but on the, on the scale of how much um, economic insecurity there is in an individual's personal employment situation, you know, at the one end, if someone has absolute job security, you're not going to get good performance out of them, right? Mm. Because they don't have an incentive because they can't get fired. Um, and at the other end, you have someone, you have the, a level of pressure where um, it's overbearing. It's on them 24-7. They're paranoid about getting fired at every minute. And again, the reaction is to hunker down, play it safe, and not lose anything. That's not an efficient outcome either. So somewhere on that scale is sort of an optimal area where there's enough tension, enough insecurity to make people work hard, but it doesn't make them paranoid and react in paranoid ways. And an argument is that the US, as opposed to, let's say, most European countries, is way too much over on the insecurity area now. <coughs> Nobody, you know, the whole um, relationship, employee-employer relationship has been severed, and so everyone's essentially a free agent now. And that's not productive in a lot of ways. Say it. But I think some of the best companies, like Toyota, I mean, I've, I haven't heard of them ever laying off anyone. And they right. stay over there for years, and then... Japanese. <laughs> but, but they also get the most efficiency, even though there might not be a fear of getting laid off, but still people perform. I don't know if fear of, you know, something might actually make you perform or not. I don't right. think that's it. And, and, when you, and, and I, I'm not super familiar with Toyota, but I'm somewhat familiar with it. And I think they've been so successful at developing such uh, a strong culture that there's a lot of shame associated with not performing at a high level. And again, we talk about the, in a minute, we're gonna talk about the um, extrinsic versus intrinsic motivations. Those intrinsic motivations are actually much bigger drivers of human behavior. And so before you even get to the notion of someone getting fired, things at Toyota are such that, you know, if, you're, if you let your team down and you don't perform well, there's a lot of shame associated with it. And so they don't even get near really underperforming to a way someone might get fired in the USA. So it's, it's a different animal. And there's also like Google, I was reading up on some of the perks that their employees have and they can spend a lot of time trying to develop themselves and uh, things that interest them and it helps them grow. And uh, most of the companies from my experience over here, they don't really focus on their employees on how they can improve and grow. They just want to get what they want right. from them, and they don't want to look at them again. And training uh, in most companies is dead. Companies don't train staff anymore. Um, and that's, that's one of the things that stuff like we're talking about. Like if we have some of these medical jobs, and let's say you're operating certain uh, uh, imaging machines or whatever it might be, hospitals probably have the wherewithal to train staff to do that. They, they probably have the people who could do it. But they're not going to do it because they're too afraid they're going to train someone, and they're going to immediately walk. And so again, that's, that's when you sever that relationship between employee and employer and there's no culture uh, of um, you know, serving and, and a give and take on from both sides, that it's a dysfunction. And so it creates uh, inefficiencies. Tim. Oh, I thought you had your hand up. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> My mistake. 
So well, we've talked about the sector. So the Southwest flight story really pulls the heartstrings about the, uh, the grandkids' funeral. So what does it say about the Southwest company culture that that pilot did that without you know, having time to get permission to do so? Pamela. Oh, it's like what they say, that if, if people can make decisions, are empowered to make decisions on the fly, they'll make the right decisions. But if they have to wait for supervisors to mm. chime in or do something or wait for permission, then right. then productivity or, or that opportunity goes away. So it just speaks to, you know, how they value autonomy, you know, for their attendants, for their pilots, for their, mm. you know, right. for their customer service staff. Strong you know. fabric in that company right. culture. Anyone else? Yeah. Yeah, I'm customer first, uh, for sure. I could, I could never imagine you know, any other American doing that. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, by the same token, you know, might there be a downside? Like, there might have been somebody that had a very similar situation to go to, a funeral or something like that, that showed up at the airport super early, that maybe if that flight is delayed, that they'll miss their connection. Uh, and they, they just didn't get a chance to tell the story because... Right, particularly with airlines. If you don't know, the the... the software that schedules airline flights and the flight crews is some of the most sophisticated complex on the planet. It's an extremely dynamic system that's very difficult to anticipate. And even a few minute delay at a gate by a departing aircraft can have ramifications for dozens of flights over all sorts of locations. And who knows if there's EMT crews trying to get somewhere to go search for a lost bunch of hikers or something in the mountains somewhere. You don't know. There could have been some terrible negative consequence. In this particular system, in a lot of environments, there, there wouldn't be that potential for it. But in this environment, there actually is. Anyone? Oftentimes, Southwest pilots will say that they're running a little late, so everybody get out and push. So, <laughs> so I think that they're aware. No, yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But Southwest is a great company, really, really well run. So um, we've talked about job security. Um, so I've used the phrase money can be the problem, but it is essentially never the solution. So how does that fit in this situation? Alan? Well, you don't solve a problem just dumping money on it. You have to develop a plan and a strategy a project and then you define the amount of resources you have and then you put the money. Great, good. Emily. I heard this one case study where um, a company had like outsourced their support and they were having a lot of concerns or expenses and stuff like that because like they were only uh, oh yeah, I just return it or and they increased it to like, I don't know, like two Profitability went up because they money was the problem. It was causing like almost a bottleneck that the people didn't have the power to make decisions on product returns. It got lost in the mail. What do I do? And they increased that and like customer satisfaction went up, sales went up. Like those people were happy with that power. Absolutely. They, they could actually do their job without feeling like they were a child having to ask about a relative pittance of money. Perna. A lot of times uh, people come up with the most innovative solutions when, when they are strict on money. So um, one of my um, like last company that I worked for, they gave us like a very, very low marketing budget and they said that, you know, come up with a plan and the best team wins. Right. And they said they that- They children. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. So that was fun. I mean, with less money, people really thought of creative- They got creative because they were forced to. Street yeah. people, I would never imagine a few people do street dances and all that. <laughs> <laughs> they did it. Cool. Tim? Uh, I think a lot of times money and, and profits are lagging indicators uh, of that you have your stuff in order before that. And the money's not going to, I mean, long term, the money's not going to be there if you don't know what you're doing. You right. don't have a, a strategy or a plan. So to say that money is the solution, like, Money is what might come out of it when you have the solution, uh, but I think too often people see money or profits as the goal when in reality that's what follows you accomplishing your goal. Right. So if you got problems like a bad boss or some, some environment things going on, just paying someone more money typically isn't going to fix that. It's not going to make them happy. Jack. In the uh, Leading Others class, we're reading this book called Widgets, and there's a whole chapter on uh, it says make money a non-issue. It basically says that um, the amount of pay, if it's adequate, won't be a problem, and by paying people beyond that, you're not going to get any increased performance. But if it's inadequate, 
then it becomes a problem. So it's not a problem until it's a problem. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's 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 a, another way of saying the exact same thing. Perfect. So, what is the intersection of superb customer service we talked about a couple weeks ago and the human economy? Where where do those interact directly overlap? Mm -hmm. Think about Virgin. Mm -hmm. other examples. Tim. Uh, I would say delighting customers and creating that emotional connection uh, for them to come back. Right. We were, we were talking about how you know, the new advertising is customer service. So if um, in the human economy, if you could manage to develop systems where the people who your staff who interact with your customer are really liking their jobs. I mean, that Virgin was a super fun place to work. And so everyone was kind of up all the time. So even though this is weird array of businesses, it was a consistent sort of strategy because they were continuing to delight the customer because they were treating them so dang well. And that's the human base. I think the article also talks about uh, removing the fear out of an empowering employees. So when they have the when they have total autonomy of what they're doing, they automatically do well for the customers as well. Right. So I think that that part right. really and interacts. That's a customer-facing form of tolerating failure, basically. Someone knew that they could do something, and maybe it would be the wrong decision, and maybe they'd even be told that it would be the wrong decision, but they'd be like, great job, nice way to go and take a chance. But you don't hear that too much in <laughs> corporate culture, right? Anyone else? OK. So what about the intersection of performance reviews, which you talked about a little bit in human economy. So how how would performance reviews be changed in a more human economy versus traditional today quarterly? You meet with your boss and you go over the eight bullet points you had at the beginning of the quarter. Alan, did you want? Well, um, I would like to think that there's a way to measure the, the, the connection you can make with the customers and how you achieve that the customer become a long-term customer, but uh, actually I, I don't think that that would be possible to say, okay, in this moment what you have done uh, is gonna secure the customer for the next five years to our company. Right, good, go ahead. Um, you would have more frequent feedback for your employees. As more opposed frequent to, feedback, good. Uh, as opposed to performance reviews, you could have feedback. Right. Uh, that kind of helps them do their job better. Good, Neil. Also have more customized or more personal feedback and not just those eight bullet points yes. like you just said. So yeah. <laughs> to get to know. That's typically the way it is. It's a safe zone. I got my eight bullet points. I got to focus on these, right? I'm safe. I'm safe. I'm safe, right? A few of those too. So. Right. Well, you also, you'd, you'd want the process to be a lot more collaborative. We talked about it, and it's, it's really weird, but like, a, you know, 360 degree review type thing where there's a lot of people who have an influence on what a performance review is, and it happens more frequently, and it happens more casually, and it's more like an opportunity to coach, not with a guillotine suspended above their necks, like, do we cut you now or next year? It's, uh, it's a totally fundamental different approach to it. And now we're gonna watch a little video on extrinsic versus intrinsic. Whether you're trying to lose 20 pounds, get that promotion at work, or quit to your goal isn't an easy task. After all, 45% of people drop their New Year's resolutions after a month. So why is it so difficult to keep motivated? And how can science help us achieve what we're after? In one MIT study, students were given two types of tasks. In the first, they had to hit two keys on a keyboard as many times as possible in four minutes, and those that did it the fastest would receive money. For some, the reward was $300, while for others, only $30. Interestingly, performance was 95% greater in the high $300 group, highlighting how money can be a motivator. But in the second task, the same students were asked to solve a more complex math problem, and this time those offered the high reward performed 32% slower than the small rewards group. This is known as the distraction effect. When we're given a task that requires problem solving, economic or emotional pressure can cause the focus to shift to the motivator, ultimately dividing your attention and reducing performance. When we look inside the brains of individuals, fMRI scans reveal that people who complete a challenge for fun and people who do it for a reward show similar activity throughout the brain. 
But interestingly, if those offered a reward the first time are asked to participate again for no reward, scans show a decrease in activity in the anterior striatum and prefrontal areas, parts of the brain linked to self-motivation. It seems that rewards may cancel out our natural sense of play. So how does this apply to you? Well, it turns out that play is the strongest motivator for sustained behavioral changes. It makes sense that we stick with enjoyable activities, but considering 67% of gym memberships go unused, it seems most of us are picking the wrong activities to achieve our goals. You might burn the most calories on a treadmill, but not if you stopped going after two weeks. Pick something you actually like doing. Your goal itself also matters. A study investigating reasons for exercise found that those focused on weight loss spent 32% less time exercising than those who said they wanted to feel better in day-to-day -day life. And while it's always good to have a positive attitude, optimism may not always be the best strategy. In a study of 210 females trying to quit smoking, participants who only imagined major success with few obstacles were less likely to reduce cigarette consumption. Positive thoughts can often trick your brain into thinking you've already achieved the goal, giving you a sense of reward and reducing motivation. But this doesn't mean negative thoughts are good. Imagining a goal coming true and then thinking through the obstacles that stand in your way is the best mixed approach. This is known as mental contrasting. Finally, try and avoid the what the hell effect. This behavior was first addressed when researchers gave dieters varying sizes of milkshakes from small to large and then offered them ice cream afterwards. It turns out those who had large milkshakes also ended up eating more ice cream because what the hell, I've already ruined my diet, I might as well go all out. <laughs> Anticipating that you will have some bumps along the road to success, whether it be a fitness goal, quitting smoking, or work aspirations, will bring you closer to making your goals a reality. Want some tips for motivation with short-term goals, like that assignment that's due tomorrow? Check out our latest ASAP thought video on the best... Yes. <laughs> Interesting bit of science there. And motivation. Human psyche. So, um, we're getting about there is about extrinsic versus intrinsic motivation. So, problems with extrinsic, which is traditional, it's external. Uh, it's increasingly ineffective. The labor knowledge to human economics is, is, uh, is what we're talking about in those transitions. Can be counterproductive, can be expensive, unintended consequences. So, um, how is intrinsic motivation related to the 2008 financial crisis? Anyone have an idea? Pamela, come on, if you're, if you're the economist, let's hear it. <laughs> well, there's a lot of things to unpack around the 2008. But I mean, mostly it was, um, it, just for me, my experience was there are a lot of people who were like, I could, I could own income property, I could do this, I could do that, I could go into debt, debt's good, you know, that there's this myth. So they just kept, right. you, know, you know, wanting that extrinsic, you know, ward, uh, usually money or right. prestige. Primarily money and um, the retail. The, a different the, the retail consumer um, in many instances did not have the knowledge to know that what they were doing was foolish right. and would definitely blow up. As opposed to some of the guys on Wall Street who were selling CDOs that they were quite well aware were garbage, right. selling it to institutional investors. Tim, you had your hand up. Yeah, I was going to say those who packaged up the CDOs. Right, so, so those guys knew they were selling garbage, but they were making a lot of money selling garbage. So there were some extrinsic rewards, some motivations provided that were highly inefficient. They weren't well structured. So these guys got rewarded on deal flow, regardless of if the economy blew up or their clients actually lost a lot of money. Right. Did you want to say something more, Pamela? Well, yeah, so you know, for people who were caught in that, Bernanke, unfortunately, blamed the consumers for not being well educated enough, which is kind of weird since he right. so it was based on. In, in our whole, let's, let's just stick with real estate. In our whole real estate system where you've got the consumer, you've got mortgage brokers, you've got loan originators, you've got repackagers, you've got you know the Wall Street guys who are making the, the CDOs based on them, you've got the institutional investors. Of all of those parties involved in this system, the most ignorant is the consumer, and you're supposed to rely on them as the backstop to our financial system. It is utterly preposterous. Right. It's laughable on its face. Tim. <laughs> Going through the process of buying a house, nobody would ever try and come in the way. Nobody would say, you should think about this some more. You should try and maybe look at something less expensive. It was 
go as fast as you can, as big as you can, until you aren't approved for a particular line of credit, but uh, nobody wanted to, to stop the gravy train, really. That's right. You commission-based compensation, extrinsic motivation, doesn't necessarily make sense. So a lot of people who were doing a lot of deals who weren't necessarily creating any value, who were reaping massive rewards. And that's why it kept going and going and going. Emily. Who was surprised ever? Uh, I'd like to say that some people have been worried because um, our on Reddit slash personal finance, people will be like, OK, you're doing all these things. You're doing all these things. You can't afford this house. And people will pay for a car. And it's, at least they know to ask. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, and if, if you guys have seen the, the movie The Big Short, which is pretty good, it's not it's not great, but it's not bad at, at getting the facts right. They talk about the the uh, exotic dancer in Las Vegas who owns five condominiums. <laughs> it's like what? Yeah, and and they were remember that they were writing loans without checking that someone had a job. They were loaning someone hundreds of thousands of dollars without confirming they had a job. This is insane. This is wrong. And unfortunately, a lot of the supposed backstops in the system, we have rating agencies that should have looked at these bundled mortgages and said, there's a lot of garbage in there. But they didn't really, because they had massive conflicts of interest because they sell consulting services to the same clients who bundle the mortgages. So they're saying, everything's gold. Everything's gold because they're getting a lot of money on the other part of their business. Um, and, and a lot of this stuff has still not been fixed. We could absolutely have a repeat of this whole thing, sadly. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Good. Move on. So, um, so why, why is it the norm? It's history. It's what we've been comfortable about, especially you know sales commissions, having someone with a really low base salary and having the vast bulk of their compensation coming from the sales, the value of the deals they do been around forever. People have a tough time giving that up. Simplicity, it's easy. Um, it rationalizes things higher up the food chain. You know, if you've got people at the mid-level in investment banks making hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, it helps rationalize a CEO uh, salary of millions and millions of dollars, right? Um, it's logical in a sense. It kind of makes sense to people at some level, right? Alternative is too hard, too fuzzy, and too far away. It's hard to do these other sort of touchy-feely sort of reward systems. It's very tough to get folks to go along with that. I need to make a confession at the outset here. Um, a little over 20 years ago, uh, I did something that I regret. For our businesses, revolves around three elements. A united reward that's modest by North American standards is more meaningful there. Same deal, a bunch of games, three levels of rewards. What happened? People offered the medium level of rewards, did no better than people offered the small rewards. But this time, people offered the highest rewards, they did worst of all. In eight of the nine tasks we examined across three experiments, higher incentives led to worse performance. Is this some kind of touchy-feely socialist conspiracy going on here? <laughs> no, these are economists from MIT, from Carnegie Mellon, from the University of Chicago. And do you know who sponsored this research? the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States. That's the American experience. Let's go across the pond to the London School of Economics. LSE, London School of Economics, alma mater of 11 Nobel laureates in economics. Training ground for great economic thinkers like George Soros and Friedrich Hayek and Mick Jagger. Last <laughs> month, just last month, Economists at LSE looked at, at 51 studies of pay for performance plans inside of companies. Here's what the economists there said. We find that financial incentives can result in a negative impact on overall performance. There's a mismatch between what science knows and what business does. And what worries me as we stand here in the rubble of the economic collapse is that too many organizations are making their decisions, their, their, their policies about talent and people based on assumptions that are outdated, 
unexamined and rooted more in folklore than in science. And if we really want to get out of this economic mess, and if we really want high performance on the definitional task of the 21st century, the solution is not to do more of the wrong things, to entice people with a sweeter carrot or threaten them with a sharper stick. We need a whole new approach. The good news about all this is that the scientists who've been studying motivation have given us this new approach. It's an approach built much more around intrinsic motivation, around the desire to do things because they matter, because we like it, because they're interesting, because they're part of something important. And to my mind, that new operating system for our businesses revolves around three elements, autonomy, mastery, <laughs> and purpose. Josh autonomy, beat me to it. <laughs> the urge to direct our own lives, mastery, the desire to get better and better at something that matters, and purpose, the yearning to do what we do in the service of something larger than ourselves. These are the building blocks of an entirely new operating system for our businesses. I want to talk today only about autonomy. The 21st in the 20th century, we came up with this idea of management. Management did not emanate from nature. Okay? Management is an, it's, it's, it's like, it's not a tree, it's a television set. Okay? Somebody invented it. And it doesn't mean it's going to work forever. Management is great. Traditional notions of management are great if you want compliance. But if you want engagement, self-direction works better. Let me give you some examples of some kind of radical notions of, of self-direction. Um, and what this means, uh, you, see, you, see, you don't see a lot of it, but you see the first stirrings of something really interesting going on. Because what it means is it means paying people adequately and fairly, absolutely. Getting the issue of money off the table and then giving people lots of autonomy. Let me give you some examples. How many of you have heard of the company Atlassian? Okay, looks like less than half. Um, Atlassian <laughs> is an Australian software company, and they do something incredibly cool. A few times a year, they tell their engineers, go for the next 24 hours and work on anything you want, as long as it's not part of your regular job. Work on anything you want. So the engineers use this time to come up with a cool uh, patch of code, to come up with an elegant hack. Then they present all of these stuff that they've developed to their uh, teammates, to the rest of the company, in this wild and woolly all-hands meeting at the end of the day. And then, being Australians, everybody has a beer. They call them FedEx Day. Why? Because they have to deliver something overnight. It's pretty, it's not bad. It's a, it's a huge trademark violation, but it's pretty clever. Um, <laughs> that one day of intense autonomy has produced a whole array of software fixes that might never have existed. And it's worked so well that Atlassian has taken it to the next level with 20% time, done famously at Google, where engineers can work, spend 20% of their time working on anything they want. They have autonomy over their time, their tasks, their team, their technique. Okay, radical amounts of autonomy. And at Google, as, most of, as many of you know, about half of the new products in a typical year are birthed during that 20% time. Things like Gmail, Orkut, Google News. Let me give you an even more radical example of it. Something called the results only work environment, the ROW, created by two American consultants in place at about a dozen companies around North America. In a row, people don't have schedules. They show up when they want. They don't have to be in the office at a certain time or any time. They just have to get their work done. How they do it, when they do it, where they do it, is totally up to them. Meeting. And that, it, and that that is a radical notion is very, very sad. Shouldn't be radical at all. Known about it for many years. So, uh, yeah, it's like you probably haven't heard of uh, Google before. So, uh, do you guys, have you heard the phrase, the self-replicating -repl talent machine? So some people refer to Google and their recruitment processes. This is one, this is Google, very famous Google I'm executive. I'm finance editor for The Economist and chairman of the Ideas Economy event series. You're about to see one of the highlights from our 2013 Ideas Economy Innovation Forum. I hope you enjoy it. Tell us what you think at hashtag Ideas Economy. We at Google get anywhere between two and a half to three and a half million unique applications every year. Uh, and we've been growing the company in the past by about 4,000 people a year to give you a sense of 
what the pass-through rate is. So no one wants to work with Google. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's amazing. Uh, no it's one's amazing. ever heard of us is the problem. If only right. people had heard of Google. Um, so how do you weed out the innovative ones? Well, we, we do. Well, we don't weed out the innovative ones. We right. try to bring try those to in. Try to find the innovative um, ones. Like but we, uh, there's, a, there's a couple principles. Uh, number one is we hire for capability uh, and learning ability before we hire for expertise. We actually would rather hire smart, curious people than people who are deep, deep experts in one area or another because a smart person who's curious and able to learn will 90% of the time come up with a pretty good answer, but somebody who's been doing the same thing forever will typically just replicate what they've seen before. And so you need a mix, but we skew heavily towards people who are kind of open to new ideas and creative. The second thing we do is um, we don't compromise our hiring bar ever. Uh, it means it takes us longer to fill an open job than it does in some other organization. But the reason is we sort of have to kiss a lot of frogs before we find a prince or a princess. And okay. as a result, we, we have a very low rate of, of um, you know, sort of people who end up not working out. And the final thing is we make the process as objective as possible. So uh, we, of course, use a lot of data to make sure we're sort of, you know, doing things fairly in an unbiased way. Um, but we, for example, don't let hiring managers make a hiring decision. Every person who's hired by Google uh, will get interviewed by a hiring manager, but that is one vote among many, and it gets reviewed by hiring committees, and eventually still gets reviewed by Larry Page, our CEO and founder, before we make an offer. Yeah, apparently Larry Page still approves every hire. So, interesting, so hiring managers, the, the person that the new staff member will report to do not make hiring decisions. Right. I don't, I don't, I don't know. Um, sounds, sounds like. Sounds like. Sounds like a little. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Edgar has a oh, comment. Question. Edgar, go. I just had a comment uh, about the hiring bar. I think in my company we had that issue several times. Uh, it seems that we approve a position and that position has a certain amount of months that you can fill it with. If you don't do that, then you lose it. So a lot of the, uh, the managers I've seen, they just have to hire somebody. So even though we don't get the right candidate, they just, just right. do it. And at the end, we, we see the, the issues because most of the time they just don't work or Right. Or they end up leaving after. That's a short the time. warm body factor because there are certain institutional systems that, yeah, can mess with that. So, but um, what do you guys think about? So, what? Put it another way. What do you guys think might be the problem with allowing the person that a staff member is going to report to to make the hiring decisions solo? Why might there be an issue with that, Sean? Group think, and I hire my buddies. One. Any other notions, Emily? Um, you know, kind of like the group thing, I guess, but it's just like you can barely can't help sure. it even if they're thinking about it. So you end up with not a well-rounded team. Hiring um, in your own image uh, is what it's called, and it's absolutely true of everyone. Uh, they tend to hire people like themselves, and that's along many metrics. I, I think if you have higher up people looking at each and every candidate, it can help them with the culture of that organization a lot better, I think, right. streamlining it. Right. Alan. Well, actually, um, in certain hiring process I've been part of, I knew after I entered the company that certain people were trying to rig the system in order to put their own people inside. That, that happened to me like two or three times. So yeah. that is highly probable if you right. just rely on one person. How might it be an issue if, uh, let's say you have a, a manager who's risen quickly through an organization and he's hiring for a certain position and several re resumes arrive where the applicants actually have deeper experience and education than the hiring manager himself? Tim. <laughs> Dangerous to have the, the boss scared of their employee that they're gonna take their job. There's conflicts of interest involved there. And yeah, that hire might actually turn out to be better at the boss's job than the boss, and he might get promoted above him. That can happen. Um, so there's all sorts of real, logical, simple, obvious reasons why it's actually a terrible idea to leave it to one individual. In fact, they should, they should, to my mind, the, the supervising manager should definitely have a very minority 
opinion in a hiring decision. So, so why are so many companies terrible at all these things? Recruiting, collaboration, intrinsic motivation, empowering, trusting employees. We kind of, we discussed it here and there. So fear, fear is a really big one. Um, and, and again, it's fear born of insecurity, of their own insecurity around their own position, their own power within the organization, their own possibility that they might not get promoted or they might get laid off or whatever it might be. That's largely the background to it. That's why so few American companies are really doing well on these metrics. I, it could also be that um, they don't want to move away from the status quo or take too many chances on what works. Absolutely. Yeah, and that's, that's a, a facet of the fear thing because they're afraid whatever they might try doesn't work well and then they'll get blamed. Mm -hmm. So they don't want to try it in the first place because they're afraid with that because they're living in and working in an environment in which failure is not, not, not only not encouraged, it's typically not even tolerated. Ryan. I think um, I've actually heard uh, big groups of managers say this before, but the perception is actually that uh, talent is just abundant and so I think that kind of fuels this attitude that they know people are desperate, so everything becomes, well, if you don't like it, get the hell out. Type thing. <laughs> yeah, because so, you know. It, it's completely wasteful, right. but I think they, like, there's, there's a factual basis to that, but then they kind of blow it out of proportion. Yeah. I mean, that's uh, an exceptionally arrogant thought. Um, and, of course, recent history, which has, so, you know, who are the companies on the planet who have created in the last 10 years the most dramatic value, period? It's like. We put Google and Facebook right up there, right? So are they loose about their hiring? Or do they take their damn time and make sure they get someone great? Well, that would kind of fly in the face of what those uh, managers would be suggesting. Um, no, wrong. Superficially, there may be lots of supposed talent. But again, there's more to it than the technical, analytical, cognitive capacities. There's all these other areas. So contrasting SAP and Google, old school versus new school, recruitment is lower priority, oh, now it's much higher, or at least for the, for the companies that are operating at a higher level. Control centralized historically, now it's getting more dispersed. Power is more in the extrinsic and now it's more intrinsic. Google World focus used to be more on expertise, now on innovation. Economy moving from knowledge to human, a little bit anyway. So industrial revolution mentality still lingers still trying to hoard control and distrustful of staff. So that's not only, that's not only stuck in the knowledge economy and unwilling to move, in the, move into the human economy, there's a lot of these behaviors that are really based in the industrial economy and it's still lingering 50 years later. One size fits all approach is, so, is at this point <laughs> extremely immature. Cost saving drivers yell at employees, you are not valued. You are short term. We will cut you if it suits us. How is that going to motivate people to do the best they can? Ignorance of science and the research around it, um, terrible. Too little experimental risk tolerance. And bringing really crude rough weapons to the task. A chainsaw to cut someone's hair. And uh, we'll watch a little of this, and then we'll, uh, we'll be done. This is um, a well-known speaker and researcher, Alain de Botton. He's Swiss. Is that we think we know what it means. Uh, if I said to you that there's somebody behind uh, the screen who's very, very successful, uh, certain ideas would immediately come to mind. Uh, you would think that person might have made a lot of money, uh, achieved renown in some field. Um, my own theory of success, and I'm somebody who's very interested in success, I really want to be successful. I'm always thinking, how can I be more successful? But as I get older, I'm also very nuanced about what that word success might mean. Here's an insight that I've had about success. You can't be successful at everything. Um, we hear a lot about talk about work-life balance nonsense. You can't have it all. You can't. So any vision of success has to admit what it's losing out on, where the element of loss is. Uh, and I think any wise life will, will accept, as I say, um, that there's going to be an element where we're not succeeding. And the thing about a successful life is that a lot of the time our ideas of what it would mean to live successfully are not our own. 
They're sucked in from other people. Chiefly, if you're a man, your father, and if you're a woman, your mother. Uh, psychoanalysis has been drumming home this message for about 80 years. No one's quite listening hard enough, but I very much believe that that's true. Uh, and we also suck in messages from everything from the television uh, to advertising to, to marketing, etc. These, these, these are hugely powerful forces that define what we want and how we view ourselves. Um, uh, when we're told that banking is a very respectable profession, a lot of us want to go into banking. Uh, when banking is no longer so respectable, we lose interest uh, uh, in banking. We are highly open uh, uh, to suggestion. So what I want to argue uh, for is not that we should give up on our ideas of success, but we should make sure that they are our own. We should focus in on our ideas and, um, uh, uh, and make sure that we own them, that we are truly the authors of our own ambitions. Because it's bad enough not getting what you want, um, but it's even worse to have an idea of what it is you want and find out at the end of the journey that it isn't, in fact, uh, what you wanted uh, uh, all along. So I'm going to end it there, but um, uh, what I really want to, uh, uh, to stress is, by all means, success, yes, but let's accept the, the strangeness of some of our ideas. Let's probe away at our notions of success. Let's make sure our ideas of success are truly our own. Thank you very much. It uh, being bad to think of someone as a loser with the idea that a lot of people like of, you know, seizing control of your life and, and that a society that encourages that perhaps has to have some winners and losers. Yes, I think it's merely the randomness of the winning and losing process that I want to stress because the emphasis nowadays so much is on the justice of everything. And politicians always talk about justice. Now, I'm a firm believer in justice. I just think that it's impossible. So we should do everything we can. <laughs> We should do everything we can to pursue it, but at the end of the day, we should always remember that whoever is facing us, uh, whatever has happened uh, in their lives, there will be a strong element of the haphazard. And it's that that I'm trying to leave room for, uh, because otherwise it can get quite claustrophobic. I mean, do you believe that you can combine your kind of kinder, gentler philosophy of work with, with a successful e economy? Um, and, or do you think that you can't, but it doesn't matter that much that we're putting too much emphasis on that? Uh, the nightmare thought uh, is that frightening people is the best way to get work out of them. Um, and uh, that somehow the crueler the environment, the more people will rise to the challenge. Um, you want to think, what w who would you like as your ideal dad? And your ideal dad is somebody who's tough but gentle. And that's a very hard line to, to, to make. We need fathers, as it were, the exemplary father figures uh, uh, in society, uh, avoiding the two extremes, which is the authoritarian disciplinarian on the one hand, and on the other, uh, the lax, uh, uh, no rules uh, 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 option. Alain de Botton. Thank you very much. Very well-spoken guy. I've read, uh, read a fair bit, uh, last thing so, read a fair bit on um, who uh, is successful in the United States. So what's the single biggest factor in someone becoming professionally successful in the United States? Money. Intelligence. Money. Parents' wealth. Far and away. Blows any other factor out of the water. What's, what's second? It's not hard work. It's not intelligence. Your connections or who you know? Yeah. Height. Oh. Oh. Height. 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 Yeah. For both men and women. Yep. We're not yep. going to make it. Yep. Sorry, but uh, <laughs> well, I'm afraid <laughs> intelligence and hard work get pushed quite a bit down the scale. So yeah, you're, you're all you're all wish, you're all gonna go go home wishing that you were six eight and born to a super rich family. <laughs> Thanks guys, we're done. Actually, that is kind of true because if you look at a lot of the politicians in this country, they're all like six feet and above. Our president's <laughs> average like ninety third percentile in height. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's a great speaker. I love him. He's he's got a nice style. Alain de Patron.
right. And, it, and it's funny because it's, it's I, I don't know why it is, and, and may, may, maybe it maybe it's, uh, says, says something not complimentary about me, but it's especially 